It is my honor to uh, be able to introduce our wonderful speakers and start out with Dr. Susan Madsen, and then I'll introduce each as we uh, come to their speeches. Dr. Susan R. Madsen is the Oren R. Woodbury Professor of Leadership and Ethics in the Woodbury School of Business at Utah Valley University. She is also the founding director of the Utah Women and Leadership Project, which focuses on strengthening the impact of Utah girls and women. Through the years, Professor Madsen has written a host of Utah research policy briefs and snapshots, reports, and op-eds. She is also a well-known global scholar, publishing six books and hundreds of articles, chapters, and reports. Madsen's research has been featured in the U.S. News and World Report, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Parenting Magazine, Chronicle of Higher Education, The Washington Post, and she is a regular contributor to Forbes. She speaks globally and in 2019 did keynotes in the United Arab Emirates, the UK, Lithuania, Denmark, and Germany. We're lucky we got her here. I'm, I'm feeling like her standing still is a rare event. She serves on many nonprofit community and education boards and committees, including Silicon Slopes, Envision Utah, Better Days 2020, Real Women Run, United Way of Utah County, Utah Financial Empowerment Coalition, and more. Madsen received a bachelor's degree from BYU, master's from Portland State University, and a doctorate from the University of Minnesota, and probably what she's most proud of, I'm guessing, she has four young adult children and two grandchildren. Please uh, welcome Susan with us today. It is wonderful to be here with you. I'm excited to be here, um, and it's been a beautiful few days, right? And by the way, I love having young adult children who do not live in my house and mess it up anymore. But my favorite thing is my two grandchildren. And one of them is, he's almost four, and another, uh, another one just a little girl just turned one. And she is just, and I'm working super hard. I just did a TEDx talk a few weeks ago, and I talked about how we should not talk about looks all the time, even to young girls. And so, but the first things that flow out of my mouth are adorable and cute. And, and then I'm like, I'm going to talk about her mobility and her stability <laughs> and her inquisitive nature. So um, do you have my slides up? Are you working on them? OK. <laughs> so what? It's not it yet. Nope. Nope, just get out of those. <laughs> I'm a whole different slideshow. There we go. All right, strengthening the impact of Utah women. I don't have too long today, so I'm going to dig right in. Um, I first wanted to say that, that I do run the Utah Women in Leadership Project. I started this work at the request of the uh, Commissioner of Higher Education and the Governor's Office about 11 years ago, and it was supposed to be a one-year project. And it is 11 years now. We're the hub of research. Um, the core mission is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women and in, in so many different ways. And we really have research events and resources. I do a listserv once a month, have about 20,000 that get that. Some of you are nodding already here on that listserv um, that really gives updates of research and the events and the resources that we do and the various initiatives. I do need to say, however, that at times, since I've for years and years done work on girls and women, people say, do you not like men? And I'm like, actually, I love men. I'm married to one. I have three sons. I do love men. And occasionally, people will say to me, to, to do all this girls and women stuff, you must have been raised with a bunch of sisters. So I thought I would um, show you a picture of my siblings. This is true. This is true. Um, so before I forget, I'm going to mention that I brought um, some materials that I'm going to leave here. I have to leave a little bit early, so I'm hoping that they'll be taken. Um, there's some folders. There's probably 12 folders, so not enough for everybody. But if you really want some of the latest, coolest research, grab a whole folder. And then there's a few other reports. One of them is on strategies men can use to support women. So if you have a husband that needs a little reading um, or some, a boss in your workplace, are you getting my 
flow here. Yeah, you'll want to pick up some of those things. So, and then some brochures um, if you're interested in that and being on the listserv. So let me dive in. I really just want to talk about two main areas. First, why does it matter? And second, a few tips on how we can change things, what we can do for ourselves and other girls and women to strengthen our impact. So why does it matter? Actually, I have a brief. I think I brought a few copies over here of this brief from 2015 called Why Do We Need More Women Leaders in Utah? At that time, people weren't talking about this so much. And it's like reviews all the academic literature on why it actually, things change. Things change when men and women work together. Things change for the good. Our communities change. I get, I'm getting teary-eyed already. Our homes change. Our church congregations change. Things change for the better, and the research backs this up 100%. And I'm the scholar in the state that talks about this, and I know the research. So I'm just going to uh, mention a few things. I don't even want to stay on this slide, but for in corporate research, when women are in the top leadership teams or on corporate boards, all of these things have been shown. And even some research on state legislatures in funding and finance, things are better when you have both men and women, and actually companies make more money when you have more women. I want to slide past that one because I have some other fun ones to talk about. Um, to strengthen organizational climate. And this can be in city councils, it can be in companies or nonprofits or other organizations. Um, you can see that the research, these are from thousands of studies now, that the research talks about decreased turnover and tension, smaller gap, all kinds of different things. And the second one, I am going to note that the research on business ethics does say that women are more ethical than men. We know that generally. Not every woman, but mostly. The, the research a couple years ago, one study says that when women do embezzle, at least they take less money. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's a real benefit there, but it is interesting, right? Um, um, reduce groupthink. There's so many other things there. I love this one. The research, many, many studies have said that girls are socialized different than boys. Girls are socialized, and I'm an athlete, and, and so I'm a little more masculine in the things I do with all my brothers, right? But I'm still more win-win solutions than most of my brothers. So boys, in, in research, believe it or not, there's research on recesses. So boys are socialized win-loss, win-loss. Men are socialized win-win-loss. But girls, more than b boys, and some of us are pretty competitive as, as, as a woman, are socialized into, let's actually look for win-win. Do we need more win-win solutions in our world today? We have to. And when women are not at the table, and it, I'm talking about church tables, PTA tables, and sometimes PTA is more women, and you, you should get a man in there sometimes to get the variety of things. When women are not at the table, Things are different. In fact, the research on state legislatures around the nation say that the states with more women in their state legislatures give money differently. Money more in those, in those states goes to things that women are more passionate about generally than men. What do you think the number one is? Education. What do you think number two is? It's actually health care. And then programs like social programs, like poverty and sexual assault, you know, um, to help victims, those kinds of things. If you have more women in your state legislature, you will give more funding to those. Where do you think we are in the state of Utah with that issue? Okay, we're trying. We're getting women in, in um, our, our areas. There's, we do ask different questions. We do ask different questions. Um, just a couple more here, and I want to get to some solutions, is uh, this, this research just basically said, and, and a lot of this is corporate research, but other kinds of organizations too. When you have, now these benefits, let me tell you, are not always the best thing if it's just a bunch of women. The combination is when it's men and women together. That's, are you following me? So I do not do my work to take men down. I do not. 
and I will never do it that way. Because the research is clear that as we lift women, we lift families. And when we lift women, we lift men. All right, if it's done the right way. And this is the way that it needs to be done in Utah. So that, and is there work to be done on gender in Utah? Oh my gosh, there's so much work to do. <laughs> I've been doing it for years and years. But don't even um, think that, I mean, we've made some progress, but anybody that says, oh, things are fine the way they are, that's crap. It is crap beyond belief. There is all kinds of unconscious bias, all kinds of discrimination still. I didn't used to see it because I don't feel it as much as many women because I was raised so masculine in my, but about 10 years ago, I opened my eyes and I feel the pain of women that are, have microaggressions just in, in things that happen and are discounted in ways and the research supports that so much. Um, so th th this, this slide is just about, you know, you tend to, when women and men work together and there's women in the conversation, you give more to society, right? And then the last one, oh my gosh, this is very clear literature that when men and women work together in those top leadership, in decision-making roles for community and for business and all different, that the innovation is better, that the creativity is better, that the problem solving is better. Do you think it's more efficient when women and men serve together in terms of time? Actually, no, sometimes. Because men have a way of decision making. I don't have time to talk about that. And women often, I'm a little more masculine in mine, have a different, so when you have more ideas on the table, it is gonna take a little longer. Does this make sense? Because you need to wrestle through the ideas and the, but the result is always going to be better. Um, and the collective intelligence. So who does it benefit? Individuals, teams, organizations, communities, government, society. The research is very clear on that. Um, and did any of you come to my event last month with uh, Sharon Eubank? And wasn't that the most awesome event in the world? And Valerie Hudson, she has a new book coming out actually tomorrow um, that will change gender on the face of the earth. That's how good this stuff that she has got. She has backed up with all kinds of variables and data how women's treatment in the home, the equality of men and women in the home, impacts the security of nations and the entire world. And it starts in the home and the equality between husbands and wives, between partners in the home. Very interesting. So how do we do this? I've got about 10 minutes to give you all, no, I'll just give you a few tips. Is that okay? Are you following me? Are you smiling? Are you nodding? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so in, in terms of this slide, I have a couple things over on that side that are more internal things. And then one over on the other side that's really more of an external. When people say, well, let's just do a bunch of training for women, that's good. But will that change everything? No. We can't just have women want to have voice. We've got to have systems and processes and things change in society. But both are important. And let me talk for a minute about both. So internal. What the research has found in some of the latest research to help women, and Utah is, we see in Utah all the gender issues that we see around the world, we see in Utah, but we see it exaggerated in Utah. So around the world, there's a wage gap problem, right? In Utah, what do you think? Wyoming used to be worse until this year, and then Wyoming is even better than us. So um, we have that, you know, um, sexism around the world. In Utah, we have a little bit more than, than most, not all the world, but <laughs> most states. Um, so internal elements, identity is one of the biggest. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Calling and purpose is a second one, and bias is uh, a third one. So in terms of leadership identity, I wanted to just, I just have a few slides on each. I love this statement from a scholarly article on um, 
meaning the internal method by which women began to navigate the fragile process of seeing themselves as leaders. Boys are socialized much more often to see themselves as future leaders than girls. Around the world, that's the case. In Utah, what do you think? A little more exaggerated. So girls generally around the world, but even in Utah even more, do not, are not typically raised to see themselves having a voice, being confident, and using their voice to be leaders. So when you're not raised, you don't see yourself as a leader, right? You don't see, and a lot of times here in Provo, you've got a female mayor, one of my friends, which girls will then say, wait, maybe a woman should be mayor. I mean, or can be mayor. But if you don't see women in those roles, these girls growing up, these teenagers growing up, are not going to even get in their minds that that's a possibility for them. Does that make sense? So we are not typically raising girls to see themselves as leaders, and that is really a key thing. I wanted to give this to you just so you had some language. When we look at leader identity development, how do we do that in girls? First one is we need to see ourselves as leaders, and we call that claiming. So we're going to claim that we're a leader. Our girls, when we're raising them, are our grandchildren. They need to claim, yes, I'm a leader. But there's two other things have to happen. This next one, relational recognition, grant. So even one person, like if I'm a, girl, a little girl and I'm like a leader, and you grant that to me, you follow and do, so, oh, good idea, you know, you follow. That's the granting. So somebody, you can't just do it yourself, somebody's got to grant you. And then the third one is a collective endorsement. So if she's in Girl Scouts, let's say, or something, and a group of people, even if it's not a formal position, but formal is great and better, you've got this endorsement. So there's a combination. So there's claiming, there's granting, and then there's this collective endorsement. So think about that, because there's got to be a, a variety of things. And I will tell you, I put this slide up to remind me to say one of the things that kind of breaks my heart, I have to be honest, is that generally women struggle not knowing their gifts and talents and strengths and not acknowledging those. In Utah, I found it's an epidemic. There are amazing girls and women who have no clue how amazing they are. And we're socialized here more than other places to be humble. And that means, you know, humility is actually just teachable. And you can be humble and know and talk about your gifts and strengths at the same time. And unless we acknowledge these are the gifts, and if we're in a religious context, which I am religious and spiritual, I say, if I'm speaking in a religi religious, these are the gifts that God has given me. And why am I trying to hide those? The research is absolutely clear that when we understand our gifts and strengths, that we can actually contribute in the world in a stronger and better way. So we've got to somehow move this, the needle more in Utah, in helping people understand their gifts and strengths. The second is purpose and calling. Actually, this is just the last 10 years of research. Women, 30 to 40% more than men, will step forward to lead if they feel called or feel this purpose. So in my leadership programs now, this is an important part. So calling can be religious, or it, it doesn't have to be religious. People that aren't religious can just feel like they're meant to do things, right? For me, my calling, I feel called to do the work I'm doing. That's the only, and most of what I do, I'm up early in the morning, is not paid work. I just do it because I'm, people know I'm kind of on fire and I've been doing this for a long time. But I personally feel absolutely called by God to do the work I'm doing. Does it drive me? Does it help me use my voice? And even if you're not religious, you can still have that calling feeling. So helping girls and women find their calling or callings. Many of us have different callings. It matters here. And some people, by the way, say to me, um, 
you know, I'll, I'll do this later when all my kids are raised or this and that. It's not the right season. I say that's all crap. You can lead every place you're at in different ways, so don't, like, put it off. Um, these are from my first two studies on reasons, like, to make a difference, just even <coughs> excuse me, exploring those. I love this quote. My deepest calling is to grow into my our own authentic selfhood, whether or not it conforms to some image of who we ought to be. As we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we will also find our, our path of authentic service in the world. True vocation joins self and service, as Frederick Buechner asserts, when he defines vocation as the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Um, and then I won't really say much about this, but the third of those areas is unconscious bias, exploring our own, but also having it help us navigate the world a little bit. Other than this slide, I'm not going to really talk about external bar barriers. I thought I would spend my time today on the internal. Um, but just know that um, this quote by Jimmy Carter is, the biggest challenge facing our world today is based on the presumption that men and boys are superior to women and girls. And there is this underlying bias that continues, sometimes not even underlying, it's right out there. <laughs> Hostile, benevolent, sexism kinds of things. That, that men and, and boys you know, are, are superior. There's that uh, in many countries around the world. Um, and a lot of it's unconscious. So as I conclude today, I've gone fairly quick, but I have a couple quotes to share and then a couple words. Um, at this time, I'm quoting Eleanor Roosevelt in March a lot because I love her stuff. And these are three of my favorite quotes. Do what you feel in your heart to be right, for you'll be criticized anyway. <laughs> you wouldn't worry so much about what others think of you if you realized how seldom they do. And do one thing every day that scares you. Aren't those great? If you haven't read much on Eleanor Roosevelt, any, anybody else a fan of Eleanor? <laughs> okay. Oh, many of you. I love uh, her quotes, and she, she was quite a character. And looking um, at the stories and listening to the stories of women are, um, of all ages can be one of the most powerful things that we can do. I always, many of you have heard me speak before, and I talk a lot about the tap on the shoulder. And I will tell you that I've done research on this, and I've read the research, and it is the most powerful thing. So we know the research, most of you have heard it, that if men, you know, want to run for public office or go for a promotion, and they feel about 50 to 60 percent qualified, they'll just, like, throw their hat in the ring. And with women, the research says it's about 90 to 100 percent. So we're just keep waiting until we're about perfect. But what the research says on the tap um, is that 30 to 40 percent more than men, because of the way we're raised, because of the way we're socialized, need a tap. Men will just, I'm good enough. And women are like, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. But if someone taps you, and I'll tell you this last legislator or this last election cycle, I tapped specifically 10 women and seven of them won. So I was, I was the first tap, tapper. I, I was like, yay. But I was the first one. And the tap could go something like this. I'll use, is it Kylie? Um, have you considered running for the city council? You know what's happening in the community. You articulate yourself well. And I believe you can make a difference. That's a tap. Anything like that. And I will tell you that that changes lives. For girls and women, two or more taps, and most of the women that I tapped this time said that it took three. And one of them, I gave like five taps <laughs> to myself, but, but it took about three people. And by the second, they're like, well, maybe I am prepared. <laughs> and by the third, it's like, it, it doesn't go away. You know, like when, when you bring up the topic with your, boyfriend of marriage, it just doesn't go away. Uh, but uh, for the, no, maybe not a good analogy here, but <coughs> excuse me, I'm on the end of a cold here. Um, but then women will start thinking about it, then they'll move forward, and then I'll tell you, 
Women supporting women is the most powerful thing out there. And there still are reports and people tell me that it's women who are not supporting them sometimes. And I say, I use this word, I don't swear, but I say that's crap. We in this room cannot be cutting women off at the knees. We must unite and help build women so that we can have a better community, so that we can have a better provo, that we can have better families, um, and all kinds of things. So as I conclude, I love this last quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I would say to you that as I have been working for a couple decades in Utah, and especially on the women's stuff, and I work a lot with nonprofits, there are so many needs in this community and in our state. There's poverty, there's one in, women, one in six women or girls in the state of Utah are raped. One in six, that's very high for the national. There are things that we as women need to step forward. We must, no matter what we want to lead, I mean people say, well, I'm not a leader. And I say my crap word again, that's crap. You are a leader, I've seen you do things. Oh, I've just done dinners and in church groups or whatever, and I'm like, that's leadership. What can we do, each of us, to step forward and choose to lead, whether that's in our homes, in our schools, in our communities, in our city councils, in our state government, to lift our state? We might be doing great economically in some ways, but there are things that we must move forward. We must help lift women, lift ourselves, then lift women, and as I said at the beginning, that will lift families and lift men. And as we do that, we will all be stronger and make an impact and really move things forward. Thanks so much for your time. If we could, for a brief moment, I would love to get a group picture before we lose Dr. Madsen. I know we, we are missing one of our speakers who will be arriving just a little bit later, but Amy and Tanay, 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 can we get a group photo with all of you, Brooke? Thank you. And then while we're doing that, I wanted to mention a couple of things. For those of you that are thirsty, uh, thank you to Coca-Cola who has donated beverages for us this morning. So there is nothing wrong with you as you get thirsty, finding your way to the uh, side over here by the it's a red Coca-Cola bin. We have some orange juice, some energy drinks for any of you that need those. Um, wherever you'd like to position them is good. And then just one more thing again while we're taking that photo. I am certain that you all found some inspiration in Dr. Madsen's speech. In your swag bags that everybody should have gotten, uh, we have a notepad for you. I'm sure there are, are many things that you'd want to take notes on. As well as on the table, you should each have, and there are a few places that don't have these, but there are plenty around. We have a trailblazer card for you. Uh, as we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the women getting vote uh, by trailblazers, and the mayor brought that up, what we hope is that you leave today with some ideas to blaze your own trails. And so we would love for you to, as you get an idea that you can walk away with that will kind of make your mark on the world, jot this down and take this home with you. I think it's so good when you put pen to paper and commit yourself to the goal that you want to achieve. So those are on there as well. So with that, I am uh, excited to announce our next speaker, Amy Stellhorn. Amy Stellhorn, ah, there we go. I like preemptive clapping, nothing wrong with that. Let's all give Amy a preemptive clap, absolutely. That is the kind of female empowerment we were talking about today. Thank you so much. All right, Amy Stellhorn is the founder and CEO of Big Monocle, an award-winning creative agency with offices in Utah and California. Big Monocle focuses on branding and brand experiences. Their full service capabilities allow them to execute across a broad range of deliverables required for a new web presence, for instance. 
Their work could include overall infrastructure, user experience, design, development, messaging, video, photo, and marketing strategies that the site would need to thrive. So this is a creative mind we get to hear from today. Big Monocle was recently named International Small Agency of the Year by the DMA Echo Awards. The logo they did for the Women's March has created an identity for a global movement in support of women everywhere. Amy has served on the board of AIGA and currently serves as a board member of Braid Workshops in support of women entrepreneurs, Child Rescue, which fights sexual exploitation of children, and co-founded the Sego Awards for female founders and CEOs. And then my favorite, she is currently obsessed with karaoke and baking sourdough bread. Amy, join us on the stage. Thank you so much. Do you want to hold it or do you want it to um, yeah, adjust that, that and let's make sure you like it? Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. When I was 19 years old, I moved to San Francisco and got my first job. And that job happened to be for a prestigious design agency. And as a result, my career took off. So today, I am 20 years into being a designer. And I run a, as was already said, I run a creative agency that I founded called Big Monocle. We have, I started it in Silicon Valley. We have some really fancy clients like Intel, eBay, Facebook, Salesforce. And we've done a lot of work I'm proud of. Um, but what I really want to talk about right now is where I am today. And I turned 40 this year, so thank you. <laughs> so naturally, uh, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about what I've done wrong in life, and a lot of time thinking about my regrets. Um, and the reason I'm thinking about that stuff is because life is really very short. And I think about how I spent the first 40 years of my life, and the place that you get to with midlife crisis is, do I want to spend another day doing what I've been doing? Do I want to spend another hour, another year, another 20 years? And it puts you into this headspace that is really wild, and it's actually really cool too. Um, but what I've realized this year, and I had, before I got the invitation to speak and heard the theme of this conference, I had just had a conversation with a friend where I said, I think I'm through with waiting for things. I'm just through with it. I think about all the years I wasted of my youth waiting for things. Um, my best friend introduced me to a song this year. Uh, I, I didn't have a Pink Floyd phase as a teenager, and uh, so I'm having my Pink Floyd phase now. And if you haven't listened to Dark Side of the Moon, do it on repeat, it's so good. But one of the songs is called Time, and I'm gonna paraphrase some of the lyrics, but it says, kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. Tired of lying in the sunshine, staying home to watch the rain. You are young and life is long and there is time to kill today. And then one day you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run, you missed the starting gun. So powerful to think about waiting for someone or something to show us the way. Um, so really that's, that's where I reflect is on some crippling anxiety over and regret on waiting for things. Um, I used to think waiting was an indisputable good. I think we talked, Dr. Madsen talked about a lot of the conditioning we receive. And some of it is, no, we wait patiently for good things to come. We wait on, you know, we wait on our partners and our families and everybody. We're patient to a fault. Um, we wait on higher powers. Um, we hear that anything worth having is worth waiting for. There's all kinds of messages in our culture about the virtues of patience and the virtues of waiting. I'm not saying patience doesn't have its place, but for me, when I looked at the times when I was being patient, it was actually a mask for fear. Um, there was actually fear, and I was saying, <laughs> I was saying, like, I'm waiting patiently, but pa waiting is a trap. <laughs> That's what I want to say. It's a trap, and Emerson said, how much of human life is lost in waiting? Um, and there are some just 
some quotes on the Instagrams about waiting that will break your heart if you want to go there. Um, it's, it's profound, um, the experiences that I've had around waiting lately. The most recent one is uh, I had a moment where I started a conversation with my husband and then I waited because I don't want to, I'm, I'm a CEO, I tend to CEO some things up, so a lot of times I like to give him space. So I started a conversation and then waited for him to meet me halfway. And I waited for four days. And I, during those four days, I lawyered up in my head and I was miserable and I was feeling like, what kind of partner do I have in this whole thing? And on day four, and I hadn't even talked to him about it, I, I'm like waiting for him. And I realized like, I hate waiting for other people. I hate. I hate just like sitting here passively waiting for him. And then I realized like he didn't even get the memo. He wasn't even on the same page as me. Here I am waiting for him when we're not, you know, I had said basically like we're not going to Philadelphia for cheesesteaks. And then he was like taking the off ramp for cheesesteaks, you know, and so that we're having this whole conflict and disconnect. When I realized like, it, well, I mean, it's pretty simple. I could have just said, hey, what did you hear when we had that conversation? And he could have said, Oh, we're still getting cheesesteaks. Like, no, 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 we're not getting cheesesteaks. This is, this is where we're at. Anyway, waiting is toxic and waiting is hard, and that could have been avoided by me not waiting and just having that conversation. Um, I want to talk through some really quick stories about uh, what I see are the lessons out of my life and also some people that I really admire. Um, the first was when I started Big Monocle, my first client was Intel. And I was in New York in my first year in business shooting a commercial that cost $350,000. And Intel, I had a PO from Intel, and I took it to the bank and said, can you give me a line of credit so I can pay for this commercial? Because with film stuff, you pay the day the shoot happens. And they were like, no, you don't have a track record, sorry. So I cashed out my 401k, I borrowed money from my uncle, or from my father-in-law and a whole bunch of things to stitch together the cash to make this happen until I actually got paid by them. And I'm running a legitimate business is where I'm trying to get at here in my first year. And I was walking in New York talking to a friend and I was like, I just don't know what title to put on my business card, I'm still frozen. And he was like, what are you talking about? You chose to play the role of CEO. Whose permission are you waiting for? How profound is that? I wasn't giving myself permission to play the role I had chose to play. I got to play that role because I chose it. And similarly, I've heard stories. I met a photographer on a panel once who uh, had gone to photography school, was interning with National Geographic, was riding a bus with a National Geographic photographer. And she says to him, when did you feel like you could call yourself a photographer? And he said, well, I went down to the camera shop and I bought a camera and then I went home and I printed a business card that said photographer on it. Like, <laughs> he just gave himself permission to be a photographer. We don't need anyone else's permission. So I regret waiting to claim my power. Luckily, I didn't wait that long, but uh, I feel like stepping into that role, stepping into leadership, stepping into managing uh, my team, uh, stepping into figuring out how to borrow money from the bank when you need to, all of, all of these things. There was a lot where I would just be kind of waiting and then I'd have to realize I was waiting and then step into my power. So it's a good reminder to me that like I'm the only one who gets to give myself permission to do that. Um, on my Instagram this last week, thinking about this talk, I posted uh, a question and just said, what have you regretted waiting for? And I got so many responses and so many that just ripped me apart. Um, but so many really, really good good thing. So one of my friends said, waiting to start my real life until I was financially successful. Uh, a CEO said, uh, life to slow down, it never does, so figure out how to, li to really live and embrace the chaos. And then there were a ton of other responses. And I mean, everything from a teenager telling me that she's sad that she, she regrets waiting to be popular because she doesn't even want to hang out with the popular kids. She was holding her life back, waiting for that moment, and then realized it was meaningless to her. Um, a friend with cancer, taking so long to go to the doctor for something I was uncertain about. Um, a friend with heartbreak, uh, my ex-wife to show up for me. Just all kinds of things, happiness, um, 
waiting to be at the right weight, all kinds of things we wait. We think like, oh, I'll do that when, I'll do that someday. Um, and I have my own stories. I saw myself in every single one of these posts, like, oh, the crippling fears, all the times that I waited. Um, the secret, I will tell you, to business and to life <laughs> is to just start doing something. Just stop waiting and start doing something. Um, you just have to knock down the first domino to get something going, right? So the law of physics is bodies in, at rest tend to stay at rest and bodies in motion tend to stay at motion. Um, I always like to also illustrate this with like, it's very hard to steer a parked car. I don't know if you've ever tried to turn the wheel on a parked car and you just cannot get anywhere. Where if you just start going a little bit, you can really get moving. Um, so that's what happened with Big Monocle. So uh, I'm not showing a ton of our work, but I have shot a commercial with Betty White. Um, this is a brand, we rebranded a film production company that's uh, one of Abigail Disney's, who's one of Walt's niece's film production companies. I'm really proud of the work we did with her. Um, we were the agency of record for the Olympic Games for Intel 5G. We've done a lot of really cool work. And the story behind that is I just had an intuition. I was running the West Coast office of a big firm, and I had an intuition that like I just needed to I was wasting my time now. It was just like that kind of a feeling. And so I quit my job. And then three months later, Intel called and because I had a client I'd worked with extensively who ended up over there and was like, we need Amy. And uh, so I didn't, I, well, so I was waiting before that. I was actually trying to buy the West Coast office of the firm I was working for. And um, I was waiting for the owner to get to a place where he wanted to do that. And then when he came to me with a number that was multi-million dollars, and I looked at what would I be buying for that, and realized I'd just be buying myself. And I, he wasn't selling me the name. He wasn't even selling me the whole firm portfolio. There was, really, there was really nothing else I'd be buying. And I was like, you know what? I need to go. So I just went. And then Intel called, and I said, yes, um, I'm actually a New Mexico LLC because it was the fastest file I could get. It was a three-day file. And I just went right in. Here, yes, here is my federal identification number as a business. So um, just said yes and started going and those things snowball until you get to places like this. Um, one of the s coolest things I've done in my career is the logo for the Women's March. And the way that this came ab about was uh, a woman at Intel who was running their global brand, her name's Teresa Hurd, uh, she took action. I'm not the one who was taking the action on this case, but I benefited from her motion. So the, it was just after the election and um, the way women were treated in 2016 during that election cycle was kind of hard to take for a lot of people. And um, so this movement, this march on Washington, it was the Women's March was shaping up and they had a really crappy graphic. I don't know if you can see it, like this thing, it was, I don't even know. And then marches were spinning up all over the states but they were all so disparate. Everyone was just making their own graphic for the same movement and this woman reached out and said hey do you guys want some help like you need a symbol for this movement and they said no no we're good thanks and then three days later they're like uh, actually could you guys help us so um, the way it worked out Intel reached out to a lot of their um, core vendors and said hey it's all hands on deck everyone can pitch ideas um, but we're gonna do this project they gave us a creative brief and one week and so my team uh, sat down and we worked out our concepts and sketches and submitted with the rest of everything and they actually picked our work so we got to execute on it and it was really a big moment so I'm, it's an icon and, and movement you're all familiar with um, thank you <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, it's it is um, an honor to have created something for the women of the world and it truly was for all of you and for all the women in the world and we actually got to go on and create um, global brand guidelines as it rolled across the world because it started as Women's March on Washington, if you remember, and then it became this whole movement with chapters across the world. So we got to the fun job of trying to figure out like how do we treat chapter level stuff like Women's March Jakarta. Um, just so cool to be empowering women around the world. Um, I want to talk about Amelia Earhart. And the reason I want to talk about her is she, when she got her first opportunity to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, it was position to her as we want to have the first woman we want to like get this headline around the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean but you can't actually fly the plane you just have to sit in the back 
And, um, and she's a pilot. And she already, I think, had the record of like the highest altitude uh, flown by a woman. But uh, she said okay, and she just started going. And I love that, because at first I'd be offended, like, how dare you? But she said okay, and she went, and that gave her the momentum that she needed to do the next thing. And within a year of that flight, she, was, she did her solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean all by herself. And on the outside of her plane, she painted, think with your stick forward. And I love that. It's like, think in motion. Just start going. Get this momentum, and then you'll, you'll be able to build on that. Um, Shauna Smith. Who knows Shauna Smith here? She's a local businesswoman. Yeah. A couple of people. So she um, started, her, so she runs four food groups. They are a restaurant chain now, uh, or like a holding company for a whole bunch of restaurant chains. And uh, it started because she was like, I really like Neaters, and we don't have Neaters where we just moved. I'd like a Neaters. And her first step was just to talk to her husband. They're like, yeah, we, we like to eat there. We wish we had one. And the first step was, well, they don't franchise. Well, let's just call and see if they will. So her first step was just make that phone call. Hey, would you franchise Neaters? Turns out they said yes. And um, one thing led to another. So she started this company. Her husband was doing off doing a tech thing, and he ended up asking her for a job. Can I come work over here? She's now like spending more time at home because her life will afford it. They have 170, I think, or 100, over 150 restaurants now. Um, they own uh, R&R Barbecue, like 70 Little Caesars, Mo Betta's, Swig, Neaters, a whole bunch of Neaters locations. I mean, they've grown into this massive thing that's doing nine figures in revenue. Um, and it all started with her calling up Neaters and saying, would you franchise your restaurant to me? Um, Jenny Wecker, another local uh, business owner, and her story is the same. Her business started because diaper bags sucked back in 20, I don't know, 12, I don't know, five, six years ago, something like that. And uh, she had a friend who was having a baby shower, and she just said, oh, I just can't find a bag. And Jenny grew up sewing uh, from the time she was old enough to walk, basically. And she said, I think I could make you a cool bag. And she made a cool bag, and then people saw it at the shower and said, hey, will you make me one of those bags? And then she put up a website and started taking orders and sewed every bag herself till her fingers were bleeding and she was dreaming in patterns. And within um, a year, she was able to then do a Kickstarter. And then she was able to launch her, like manufacture overseas so that she wasn't sewing every bag by herself. And then grow a really successful company to today, her proud moment is she's, one of her dreams is being at Nordstrom's. He Uh, I also want to talk about Lillian Hayes, who you will meet later today at the end of this banquet. She's being honored. She's actually my grandmother. So I didn't know that she was getting an award until I saw the program. And uh, I'm just so pleased that she's being honored. She's 100 years old. She's in fantastic shape. She's lived in the same house and neighborhood forever, just a few blocks from here. And she is responsible for saving our drinking water. And she did that with small steps, too. She saw an article that said they were going to build a freeway, uh, build, build a new Provo Canyon free, four-lane freeway. And she looked at the plans, and she was like, that's going to harm our drinking water, I think. And she, her first step was to walk over to her neighbor, who was a 90-year-old dude who ran water. And he like, knew everything about water. And she said, hey, don't you think this is going to impact poorly our water? And he said, yeah, actually, that's that's gonna cause a problem. And it wasn't just like the problem was solved. She went to the city council, they dismissed her and said they trusted the Department of Transportation. She had to persist, she had to keep working, and eventually, um, eventually like, she was able to put a stop to them doing it the way they had wanted to do it, which would have absolutely uh, destroyed our drinking water. And in fact, um, I posted about her just last month and my friend said, hang on, I can't quite read it from this angle. Um, this was so cool, because this is somebody I met in California. Um, he said, I had no idea you were related. I met her years ago when I was an undergraduate at the University of Utah working on Provo River issues. Everyone in that watershed owes her a huge debt of gratitude. So thank her today when you see her. <laughs> yeah. um, Pat Bagley did a cartoon. There's an article about how Lillian Hayes saved Provo Canyon Springs. So she's an awesome woman who started with a step. Um, and the most recent thing that I've, I have uh, been working on is this award show for female founders called the Sago Awards, 
We uh, chose the name Sago Awards because the Sago lily flower blooms despite very harsh conditions in the desert. And Utah women, as Dr. Madsen just outlined, are not blooming in the kindest of conditions. Um, and what we wanted to do was just shine a light on women who are in business. And part of this was because I had moved to Utah three years ago and I was starting to get into business groups and there were hardly any women around and people were like, well, Amy, where are the women? And I was like, I don't know. How would I know? Like, how come women aren't winning awards? How come we don't know where they are? And, and fed up one day, I just said to my friend Trent, who's, um, ooh, whoops, uh, the Asian man right here, he, I just said, someone should start an award show for women. And he was like, yeah, we should do that. And we just started doing it. And now we're in year three. The awards gala is on May 10th. Our finalists for, we, we have already taken nominations. We judged yesterday. And on Monday, there'll, I think there'll be a press release that'll go out about who is being, um, who are our finalists this year. We're stoked to be highlighting women. I can tell you that in our highest revenue category, so the women you think we would know, these are the like eight figure financial people, women who are doing eight figures in business. There are several women on our top 10 that none of us knew, not even the VCs on our panel or our judging panel. We, none of us knew that these women existed, so we're so stoked to be uncovering them. Year one, we had 200 nominations. This year, we had 1,200 nominations for women in business. Thank you. Um, so I want you to just take a moment, and you can flip to the card on the table or your notebook or text. Actually, no, I want you to talk to the person next to you, and I just want you to s tell them your big idea. It can either be your big idea, or it could be, and you have to like work with me here because we don't really have time for workshopping hard. But... Um, Tell me your big idea or the thing you've been waiting for that, that just popped into your head. Just take one minute and exchange that with someone next to you. Okay, now if you'll indulge me, I want you to write down or text yourself or, or tell your neighbor, but probably let's not tell our neighbors. Let's just write or text ourselves. What is the tiniest thing you can do towards us? And I want the tiniest. I want it to be so easy. It doesn't even feel like a step. I want it to be so small that like, it, it feels like you're doing nothing. What is the tiniest thing you could do towards this? Sure, what's yours? I mean, oh, no, write it down or text yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you wanted, what's yours? Shout it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, shout it up. What, that's awesome. What is the tiniest step? Uh, that is amazing. Do you know if you want to go in Utah or you want to look outside? Okay. So maybe pull up their website and look at the admission criteria. Something like that. Cool. Or even text someone else who will hold you accountable. We have someone else who wants to share. I love it. Real quick. Mm. Oh, so I love that. Where are you going to share your story? Going to do a live, going to post it in tech. Okay, Instagram live by when? Do it today, girl. Yeah. Woo. Tag us. Ta hashtag Provo Women's Day so we can follow your story. Um, and that's the last piece. I want you all to say by when. Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? I'm going to text my mom about this thing today. I'm going to read about it online today. When, it, when will you do that tiny, tiny thing? And let that, let that first piece just create the momentum that you need because an object in motion stays in motion. And I want you to think that when, when you have that thought in your head that somebody should do this, I want, just like we did with Sago Awards, somebody should do an award show for women's. I want you to go, maybe I should do it. So maybe I'm somebody. <laughs> That's what I want to leave you with. Maybe I'm somebody who could do that thing. All right, thank you so much. Dr. Madsen, I'm going to catch you one more time before I let you go. Do you want to grab... Uh, I cannot miss an opportunity to grab a picture with our four strong speakers and our very strong mayor. So I'm going to invite the mayor to come up. Um, Yvonne, if you would join us as well. Amy, please, and Tanae.
So we're going to do this one more time, which will give you some nice opportunity to sneak over and get yourself a drink if you'd like. What's that? Yes. And, yeah, Dr. Madsen just reminded me again, and I don't want us to forget, she has brought some wonderful literature for us that's off, off to the side here. So whenever you have a spare moment and want to grab some of that, please do. Where is my photographer? Right here. Okay. Bring them out. Thank you so much. We've got some flowers for you, and then our photographer, I think, is going to position position you over by today, I believe. No, no, no. Because it's so sweet. Can we just go stand over there? Yes, thank you. She's, uh, they'll probably take a cup of How about we all take a moment to give these ladies a hand for what we've learned and what we will. Thank you for that pause. I would like to do something else if I could get uh, your cooperation. So we had, oh, this microphone. We had picture of five strong women up here. I see a whole room filled with strong women, and I would love to capture it in picture. So with that said, I'm going to take a photo, but I would love for you all to look up here. All right, let's celebrate this day with a room full of women. I'm going to count to five and then just make some gesture, you know, not, not to, uh, an appropriate gesture. That's always, we always think the wrong thing when we say that. You know what, if that's the gesture you want to make, go for it, that too. <laughs> Sometimes it's appropriate. All right, one, two, three, four, five. Smile, here we go, woo, Women's Day. It is so fun to have you. I wanted to just, before we get to our next speaker, I wanted to share something, and I will not point her out, but Miss Emily, so I'm just going to look in the general range, came in and offered to help us this morning. I had never met her, and she came in and just helped us set up. And she made a comment that I thought was very powerful. She said, I'm a little nervous because I haven't been in a room filled with women before. Or it's been a long time since I've been in a room with this many women. And I want to say, do you feel the energy today? There is such power in being in a room. As I was listening to claps for the accomplishments of other women. I was listening to, I was hearing way to go. I was, I was hearing women supporting women. And that is in, in large part what this event is about today. Um, I wanted to say that on my trailblazer card, I wrote just start. Having been inspired by Amy, uh, when I get in that moment, I tend to paralyze. So that was one of those comments that really spoke to me. And I hope you're all feeling something that speaks to you as well. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce Tanae Henry, who uh, for me has a special, woohoo, again, preemptive clapping, I love it, Tanae. Uh, when Tanae first moved to Provo, she was captivated by the mountains, which we have a lovely view of out here. She loves to hike in the mountains to see what she can see. That attitude has blended, blended into her personal and professional life as well. She loves to walk along paths and see what she can learn, do, and become. And she has a special place in my heart because she has given of herself 
for the generation coming up. Four years ago, Tanae started the Provo Girls Summit. For those of you who have heard of that, who's heard of the Provo Girls Summit? You're going to hear more about it, I'm sure, today. It is a career exploration event for girls ages 8 to 12, which allows attendees to meet women professionals from a variety of professions and encourages them to consider what they might learn, do, and become. Since Provo Girls Summit start, more than 750 girls have been introduced to 80 different paths. Is that amazing? possibly changing the trajectory of so many of those young girls. Provo Girls Summit is now part of a nonprofit called Introducing Tomorrow, where Tanae is the executive director. Tanae was honored as a 2019 Sago Award finalist in community and culture and 40 under 40 honoree with Utah Valley Magazine for her work with Provo Girls Summit. Tanae is a content creator at the RBL Group. She and her partner are raising their four children here in Provo. It is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Tanae. I started attending um, Susan Madsen's groups. She has those monthly um, emails and events. Thanks. Um, and that's when I felt like there's something I can do here. Um, such an honor to be with you all today and with my friend Amy and my one of the women I look up to. Um, Dr. Madsen, I will stop crying eventually, I'm sorry. Um, Amy was talking earlier about Amelia Earhart, and I don't know if you know this, but I, I learned it within the past six months. One of the things that she did as a, as a young woman was she kept a journal of women in professions that she thought were cool. And when I learned that, I was just so excited to To think that even back then when women were doing fewer things than they are now, she recognized the importance of that and she wrote it down and she kept notes about it. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here and I'm th excited to tell you about what I do, um, but I, I do have to tell you that uh, Provo Girls Summit is a matter of the heart for me. I'm the mother of two young girls, raising them in Utah. and. Um, put a lot of thought and effort and heart into, into what we do. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a story about myself and get started. And I'm a paper person, so um, here we go. When I was young, I grew up on a street where I got to play in the street, right? And um, I come from an athletic family. So one time, when I was about five years old, we were playing uh, baseball. And my older brother, he's about five years older than me, he was pitching. I was playing first base. And um, when my brother pitched the ball, the kid who was hitting hit a line drive down the third baseline. And so I, having been an avid sports fan, showed up to my base. I was ready to catch the ball, you know, still being flexible enough to lunge in case. <laughs> The ball went up or down, farther away from me. I was ready for it. And um, the third baseman fielded the ball just like he was supposed to because his whole family also played baseball. And fielded the ball, and he went to throw it to first base across the street. And then instead of throwing it, he contorted his body and underhand lobbed me the ball. <laughs> I don't think I have to tell you this, but we did not get that out. Um, and I was confused because he knew what he was doing and he didn't throw me the ball. My older brother, who was on the pitcher's mound, pitcher's mound, um, looked at him and said, what are you doing? In this tone of voice that only Italians can like muster. What are you doing? And the guy shrugged his shoulders and he said, she's a little girl. And so um, I know that in that moment, I remember this. 
I was like, I was like shaking my head, punching my mitt, like, I got this. Throw me the ball. Um, but what he like didn't know was that I had grown up playing baseball, right? Also, I was the only of two girls on the all-star team. So, thank you, thank you. But what I had been given was exposure, practice, and support. And when we have those things, we can be good at anything. And so that's kind of the idea with Provo Girls Summit. So um, when we give people exposure to any field, and then we provide them with support, um, they can, they can um, flourish in that area. Um, so as was mentioned in my introduction, I, maybe I didn't mention it, I don't remember. I am a former teacher. I taught English at, at Timfew High School here locally. And yeah, it was also a, that was a, a great time for me. Um, but uh, I will never forget the day when I called my husband to say, I'm done taking care of other people's kids. Um, I'm just going to go home and take care of mine. So we made that decision. Um, and this is a very familiar situation for people in our town, right? Uh, where it's something that we're comfortable with. I was comfortable with becoming a teacher. I had seen a lot of women go into that field. And then I was comfortable becoming a stay-at-home mom. Uh, that's what my mom did. Um, and and the, I think that those are really great options. But I just wanted to point out a couple things here. I think that when we think of Utah, we think, oh, like everyone's a stay-at-home mom there. But I just wanted to show you this information from the um, census, which I actually, you guys, Susan Matson's group does incredible research. And this is information that I've gotten from them. So if you look, you can see that um, more than half of women start working from ages 16 to 19. And then the entire time, um, more than half of women are working at every age until we start getting down up to the senior, senior levels, okay? So it's good for you ladies, get out of it, retire. Um, but I, just, I think that this information is incredibly important to know because when decisions are being made, you guys can't hear me, I'm sorry. Uh, because when decisions are being made and they're not considering that women are in the workplace, that's a misstep. It's a missed opportunity. Women are in workplaces. And that we need, we need the, um, the structure to support that because we're working, okay? So typically what happens in Utah is women end up working in fields that are um, less prestigious and then also they pay less money. Um, so these are important important things for us to consider. Um, studies also show that this preparation and building this structure, it needs to happen at a younger age than we realize. Studies show that children's views of the world are built so quickly that as early as age 10 or 11, children have already strong ideas about gender roles. Children as young as seven may have ideas about the different type of jobs that men and women should do. And these views uh, that children develop are based on the repeated behaviors which they see within their lives and they form what's called the schema, patterns of repeated behavior that allow children to explore and express developing ideas and thoughts through their play and exploration as a way of categorizing and understanding the world. And in fact, I actually, I don't know if any of you saw this Barbie ad recently. It was just, I just saw it yesterday. Barbie does really great things right around International Women's Day every year. And yesterday, what they said uh, has a, little, a bunch of little girls saying that as early as age five, girls have already started counting themselves out to become things like scientists, engineers, um, pilots, all of these things at the age of five. Ladies, we have work to do, and it starts earlier than 35. So at a 35 is when I decided, oh, I can do something about this. But... And at 35, I think a lot, of a lot of us find ourselves kind of questioning, what are we doing with our lives? But these things have to start earlier. And, um, and we need to be paying more attention to the socialization, which um, was already talked about today, and the information that our girls are receiving. Um, these schemas and unconscious biases affect every single area of our lives, but one area that ends up being very influential in a girl's life 
is the patterns we hold about what men and women can and should do in terms of jobs and careers. The repetition of seeing women in specific areas and men in other areas creates the schemas and that is what sticks. For girls, whether they're looking at potential careers or fields of study, this can be especially tricky because of a number of major factors. Women are highly segregated. Sorry, we already talked about this because I went off notes, but I'm not saying that we should always encourage girls to do um, STEM, but I am saying that we can encourage girls and we should encourage girls to do whatever they want. If they're interested in being a pilot at a young age and they want to pretend that, then we need to let them do it and we need to encourage it. Um, some of the best advice I got in my young ooh, 20s was that I should, um, I should definitely have a plan, and this is, anyway, I'll just say it. I was informed that um, most women end up single and supporting themselves b before they're 60. That is something that we need to understand and that we need to have a plan for. I can't always rely on somebody else's income. And I need to have an educational plan and a career path. Um, and my own daughters do too. So ideally, um, while, while girls are young, they could see women who are in jobs that they love so that we can, their schemas are forming around the idea that women do have options for careers and families at the same time and that they can succeed at any type of job that they find interesting. This is called exposure. And this happens in sports all the time. So if you want your child to be a soccer player or a track runner, you take them to events and you watch their skills and then um, you discuss sort of what's going on and the intricacies of that. Um, so I'm curious from you guys, how many of you went into careers that you're actually familiar with? Like you stepped into something that your parents did or a good friend's family. Well, you guys, just by a raise of hand, how, how many of you guys kind of did that? Okay, so it's, um, I think it's fair to say that we kind of step into what, what we're familiar with. Um, okay, so I see that in my own life. Um, like I mentioned before, I went to teaching and I went into um, being, becoming a stay-at-home mom, which is what I had seen. And then my husband also, he had this really, he had this uncle who worked for Adobe back in like the 90s. And so when my husband received the Creative Suite software, he got to spend his time um, as a teenager, like instead of playing sports, he was like tinkering around on Photoshop. And he was familiar with that and that was easy for him. And so now he, he's a digital artist and he works on the computer all day and he loves it. And I see that with my daughters and my sons, they see their dad doing this, so they do it too. And this is just our way of life, right? So whatever way of life we present as normal to our kids is what they're going to believe. And so we get the option of showing them things that we want them to think of as normal. Um, the possibilities and options are very important for girls to understand, especially girls in Utah. Um, unfortunately, and I don't need to go into all the specifics because Dr. Matson already did, but um, a couple of things. Some headlines that I've seen about Utah women um, and women, the state of Utah, the state of women in Utah um, really have broken my heart. And in about 2000, I think it was, um, it was this one, the 24-7 wall, the 10 worst states for women. Um, I read that and I went into my husband's office and I said, hey, we got to go. We're not raising our daughters here. Why would we subject them to this when there are other places that we could live? And then I stopped myself as I was saying it, and I thought, but wait a minute. I have great friends here, um, women who are powerful and giving and incredibly intelligent, and they show up. And so when we talk about women in Utah, I think it's really important that we look at it as a whole, and then we look at it on an individual level as well. Um, these things are likely true about Utah, but also we have a lot of really important and good women here and who are, doing, who are showing up to do good things. Um, but we need to do more, and we have to stop saying things like, I'm not a leader, I just want to be in the background, just tell me what to do. 
we need to start saying, I know what to do, and I'm going to do that thing. Um, so anyway, with, with sort of seeing these things, also the statistic that um, Dr. Madgen shared earlier where one in six women will be sexually assaulted, you know, a lot of things kind of led up to the beginning of Provo Girls Summit and me thinking, at 35 years old, we should know better who we are as women, and that has to start earlier. So I started an event called Provo Girls Summit, and Margo, would, or Margo, would you do me a favor and push play on this? Um, this is just a, a small video that we have. So what we do, it looks like a career fair. Oh yeah, go ahead, Marco, sorry. It had started a second ago. It maybe went to a YouTube link. Can you see if that opened up? Can you make it full screen for me, pal? Thank you. That's my little girl. So this is Mindy Gledhill. We've had incredible support from the community. That's Allie Condi. She's an author of young, of young adult novels. This is a wild firefighter. Um, she's a mechanical engineer professor up at the U. This is a paleontologist from the Natural History Museum of Utah. This is Heidi Achikar. She's local. She's a um, an attorney at Fillmore Spencer. This is Uni Kim. She's a software developer at EKR. This is, uh, I forgot her name, she's a pilot. These are eight to 12 year old girls who show up. This is Dr. Savage, she's an OB, OBGYN at Grandview. This is her assistant who was pregnant and the girls got to find her <laughs> heartbeat. This is Trisha Zemp who's a stop motion animator, animator with uh, huge clients like Etsy, Lindor Chocolates, Bed Bath & Beyond. It's Mayor Curtis back in the day. So it looks like a career fair and every person hosting a booth is a woman um, professional and then we bring in girls who are ages 8 to 12 to meet them and talk with them. So it's not a situation where um, an adult is speaking to them, but they're face to face, shaking hands, interacting, asking questions, um, looking, looking at each other in the eye. Um, and we've been running it, this is um, 2020 is our fourth year. Um, we sell 600 tickets every year, and this year they went in 24 hours. Um, there is a huge demand and incredible interest for events like this and access for girls to, um, it's a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, 
to recognize their options, um, and we're, we're so thrilled about it. So um, none of this could be done without, without incredible support um, from, from local volunteers. We all volunteer our time. Becca here is, is one of our people on our planning committee, and we work really hard to make sure that this happens. Um, this is our list of professionals throughout the past three years. I don't have any of them up here from 2020, but um, we got some good ones, including two entomologists and a zookeeper from the Loveland uh, Aquarium, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so um, there's that. And then this is our, one of our girls. This is Eva, and Eva came to the very first Provo Girls Summit and then the next year she started participating in our, Provo, in our Girl Summit art show that we do with the Neighborhood Art Center. Um, and I just love this story that her, her mom tells us. So let me read that to you. She says, my daughter Eva was born feisty and has always known her own mind. We've always taught our children that they can grow up to be whomever or whatever they would like to be. Eva growing up said she'd like to be a teacher who is also an artist, most often when she was asked. So when I heard her mom, when her mom heard about Provo Girl Summit, I was excited to take her, not quite knowing what to expect. She left buzzing with excitement and confidence. Mom, 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 I think I want to be a scientist. How cool would that be? Or even a stop motion artist. Did you see how fun that was? Of course, Eva. You can be whatever you want to be. I replied for maybe the millionth time in my life. But it occurred to me as her mother in that moment that there is a dramatic difference in telling a child they can be whatever they want and showing them the same thing. Um, um, I was an English writer, or an English teacher, so there's always the show and don't tell. Um, I'm from Missouri, the show me state. I understand the power of modeling behavior, and this is one of those times um, when girls can see that women in, their so, in similar social pressures and under similar circumstances have become whatever it is that they wanted to become um, is incredibly powerful for them to address this, the repeated schemas, and give them the information that they need to know that, you know, maybe they've never met an astronomer before who was a man, or an attorney, or um, a mechanical engineer, and even if they had, then once they've met and talked to, to women who do the same thing, uh, they're more likely to consider it for themselves a, as an option. And I, I think that what we're doing at Provo Girls Summit is incredibly important and I think that it's not perfect, but given the state of women in Utah, I don't think we have time to wait for the perfect answer and that we all have to get up and we have to do something right now. We don't have time to wait. Um, and so, here we are. Um, I have four things that we can do to support girls right now. Um, the first one is to talk to them about big ideas, and I love that Dr. Matson brought up already that we should not be talking to girls about their appearance or or women, uh, there is so much more to each of us than what we look like on the outside. It's the most uninteresting thing about us. We have so many things that we can do. Um, so we do these art classes with the, with the Neighborhood Art Center and one of the artists, Mary Lee, was teaching a class to a bunch of girls and the first thing she started with was, what, is your ho what are some of your hobbies? One of the girls said that she was into comedy and uh, what an exciting thing for a young girl to be in, into. And if we can talk to her about that more, maybe she will see herself as a stand-up comedian or um, a talk show host or something that she can do and monetize that. Because as women, we need to be concerned about being able to make money. Um, and then also, um, my own daughter answered that she was, um, her hobby was planning things. And she's very good at planning things, but until the moment when she said it, I just thought, huh. Yeah, she does that, but it's not really like something. But it is something. And these little things that our daughters are doing are things that we need to be talking to them about and, and building upon. The second thing is that we can make connections for them. So when, a daughter, when one of our girls shows interest in anything, we can look up a YouTube video about it. We can get a book from a library. These are small steps that, that we can do right now. Um, or we can find somebody in our circle of, of peers and friends and and give them somebody to talk, to talk to and ask questions about. Because it's also very valuable for a girl to know what she is not interested in as early as possible. Um, next thing we can do is invite them to try and fail. And 
that's just all of life, right? Like, we show up and we try something and we fall. I go to my kids' gymnastics class. You guys, all those kids do for an hour is blow it. They fall and fall and fall and fall. And we watch them. And when they finally hold like a handstand for like two seconds, we are so thrilled. This is how every, everything is. We're going to blow it a billion times. And the one time we make it, we'll understand what it feels like. And then we'll be able to make it again and again and again. And that is how realities are built. Um, and then also, we can let them see how we fail. Like I, I just learned how to ski three years ago. I'm from Missouri. Um, I just learned how to ski. So I took my girls up this year. They've been in ski school because they're Utahns. And it was embarrassing. My daughter, <laughs> we were getting up the ski lift. And my daughter's like, Mom, scoot over. Don't touch me. You're going to knock me over. And this is the reality because I'm not, I'm not good. Um, but they need to see that I fail, too, and that I'm not good at things, and I need to apologize when I blow it, and that's fine. And then the last thing that we can do is we can advocate for girls. I'll never forget the time I blew it for this one. I have a little girl, and we were reading a National Geographic um, article about zombie bugs, and um, there's these ladybugs that get taken over by this other bug, and then it uses its body and goes around, and it looks like a ladybug, but it's not. And uh, it's all a lie. And this... My little daughter was started to tell a friend about it, and my friend said, kids and zombies these days, they're just everywhere. And I didn't say anything, guys. I blew it. I didn't stand up for my daughter and say, actually, she just read an article about that in the National Geographic, so it's a real thing. And um, yeah, so you can learn something too. Um, but that's not going to happen again, right? Um, I can advocate for my daughter. Um, so. If the other two speakers hadn't been so good, I wouldn't have been on edge when I got up here, guys. <laughs> um, another great example of advocating is if we can go back to the story of when my brother looked at this kid and said, you know, what are you doing? Why didn't you throw the ball to my sister? Um, and the guy said, well, she's a little girl. And my brother, this is my first feminist moment, and um, it was from my older brother. And he said, hey, you throw the ball to her just like you throw it to me. And that message is, oh my gosh. Is that? Um, that has been something that I've come to expect because my older brother told me that I should expect it. Our girls deserve to be treated as equals. And when we start treating them as equals, they will start to recognize that. And it starts in our homes, it starts with the way we talk to them, the way our, our, their fathers talk to them. Girls need to understand from a young age that they are capable of important thoughts and ideas and of working hard. Thank you so much for having me. of thoughts I took away from that. Uh, as I said, I had a special place in my heart because she speaks to young girls. I brought my daughter with me here today, Cami Martin, uh, and it has been nice. I wanted her to see what I do, uh, what I do for a job. I, she sent, uh, it was my birthday, I won't tell you how old I was, but she made an Instagram story for me and one of the screens that she put up was a screen capture of my doing an interview with KSL and she put above it, she's legit famous. You are, true, you are actually a true legend, go mama. None of that is true, I am not a legend, I am not legit famous, but I love that my daughter sees that in me when she looks at me, and it meant a lot to me. And that, to me, is what Tanae is, is doing. It really is special, that's when we're in a room together. Uh, our kids, our daughters do look up to us. They do learn from us, and they are inspired by us. And so the work you're doing is amazing. Uh, we have one more speaker. Uh, we are running a little bit long, but I think we are learning great things. So it's all right to run long when you're being inspired. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Yvonne Baraketsi. Am I saying that right? Thank you. 
Yvonne grew up in Rwanda, East Africa, and moved to Belgium as a refugee during the Civil War in 1994. She lost her father and half of her extended family in the conflict. After receiving her bachelor's degree from a Belgian university, Yvonne and her husband moved to Louisiana to pursue higher education living in culture, culturally rich New Orleans before relocating to Utah's refugees for the second time from Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina in September 2005. After returning to school to complete their U.S. bachelor degrees equivalency in 2009, the Barraketsis returned to Belgium and Yvonne worked for the British Embassy and the U.K. Represent representation to the European Union. In 2014, Yvonne and her family moved back to Utah to pursue their dream of getting higher education. She graduated with a Master's of Public Administration from BYU Romney Institute, after which she switched her career to education. She then went back to school for a second master's degree in educational studies from Western Governors University to become a certified teacher. Yvonne is currently a French dual language immersion teacher with Provo City School District. The Utah Dual Language Immersion Program uses a 50-50 model in which students spend half of their day in the target language and the other half in English. Yvonne is also the founder of, I'm going to say it wrong and you're going to correct me when you come up here. Go ahead and say it so I don't, Nagoma. Nagoma. All right, she says it much better than I'm just going to let her have that one. Uh, Cultural Center, a nonprofit based in Provo whose mission is to preserve and increase understanding of African culture through the arts, such as storytelling, languages, music, dance, and other educational experiences. Yvonne speaks five languages, has three children, and enjoys serving the community, and it's a pleasure to have her here as our concluding speaker. Thank you, Yvonne. Bonjour. Okay, you guys have been sitting for so long, so I thought I would do a little brain break. Um, just a little demonstration of a minute. Okay. Oh, of course. Yes. We're friends, but we're not that good of friends, right? Keep your passwords to yourself. Right. So, oh, can just skip this, right? Um, we'll explore. Okay. So, my name is Yvonne, and uh, she already did the presentation. Um, I chose to speak about education because without education, I wouldn't be standing in front of you here today. So it's an honor and privilege to share all the different things I've learned through the empowerment of getting an education. 
And education is a broad word, okay? We're not talking about getting an education of getting a degree. It's really, let's find out what it is. First of all, here's my family. I have three kids, as I said, and my husband. So these are the people who educated me the most every day. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you think you all figured it out, and you learn every day to be a better parent, a better spouse, a better yourself. So um, I chose the quote of Nelson Mandela. So Nelson Mandela, um, he, was, uh, he has a very interesting story himself. So he's from South Africa, so he passed away, by the way. And he said that education is the most powerful weapon uh, we can use to change the world. And uh, why did I choose that? It's because I, that's what I've learned in my life. And education, as I was saying, its definition really that struck me was it is the most empowering force in the world. It creates knowledge, builds confidence, and breaks down barriers of opportunity for children as their key to open the door to a better life. So me as a child in Africa growing up, um, I was born in a family of, my two parents, they came from very humble circumstances. Um, they both had to go to school, obviously. My dad uh, is the one who got the most education on the left, so he passed away in 1994. But he and my mom had already, always insist, insisted on us to have an education. So whatever happened in our lives, they really wanted us to get the best of an education you could have. So my dad, I remember growing up, how he used to tell us how he used to walk every day for like two hours going, two hours coming back to go to school. And those stories has shaped my um, understanding of how important it was. To the right, my mom and me in the middle in the uh, light dress and siblings and cousins. And in fact, I was trying to find some pictures of when I was in Rwanda. And of course, we lost a lot of them during the war. Um, so my mom, she's the most person I know, she's the person who educated me the most and who still impacts me a lot. Uh, we are standing in front of the garden um, that we planted with our hands. So we had mates back home because I grew up in a family that was, uh, as I said, uh, came from humble circumstances. By, by the time we left Rwanda in 1994, my parents, um, my dad was actually um, one of the key personality in the country and so we had a privileged life, as you would say. But my mom, um, she would be this kind of woman who would be like, nope, we have a maid, but when we have to plant the garden, you use your, you, you use your fingers. Um, and I used to be very mad at her, and I understood later why it was important. And so one thing I've learned from uh, having extended family around, um, so to the left, you can see my grandma, on my dad's side, um, I remember when I learned to éplucher, how you say that, uh, aide-moi, madame, perle, éplucher, to peel. Yes, I'm glad she's here, or some people can, <laughs> my English is getting worse, because I teach French on a regular basis, and I feel like I'm losing it. So, so she, she told me how to, I remember sitting next to her in her humble house, a little hut, in hut, en fait. She didn't have a house that had electricity or water. Um, she told me with my dad to peel the potatoes. And um, to, the, sorry, to the right, you can see uh, my, on my uh, mom's side, so Monsieur Venerand. So Venerand is my grandfather, and he was an educator. I remember my parents driving us to their village, and we would pass by the little school in the village where he used to be an educator. Um, and they really, being surrounded by them, they told me, very important uh, life lessons on the importance of family. In Africa, um, that is one of the, you know, the things that help the society. It's to really um, acknowledging the family as, the, as very important and as uh, the people who teach you the most around you. And then tragedy happened in my life. Uh, so when I was my daughter's age, uh, on the 6th of April, 1994, my life collapsed. Uh, my dad, who was the chief of staff, was assassinated um, firsthand, and half of extended family. 
you can imagine uh, the trauma that came out of it. It's actually later in my adulthood that I put a name on what I was experiencing. And even today, I had to really go back and search about all those different things I've heard about people saying um, on um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I realized it's really something that has been following me my whole life. Even today, when I don't take care, I have to be experiencing some of those things. So for some of you, I'm sure you know what it is, and don't think actually it comes only from living through a tragic thing like a war or uh, big uh, things, but what does, what does it mean actually, post-stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder? It's a mental disorder that can develop after a person is exposed to a traumatic event. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, actually, let me just ask a question. Raise your hand if you've experienced a traumatic event in your life. Okay, and so what it means, uh, it can be sexual assault, it can be warfare, it can be traffic collisions, it can be child abuse, it can be other threats in uh, a person's life. Symptoms uh, include thoughts, feelings, dreams, etc. So all those things like thoughts and feelings and dreams and really the desire to suicide myself I've experienced it as a teenager in Belgium. And I eventually, because in our society in Africa, I mean, I grew up in a family, even if um, my parents have lived in Europe to get education and have you know, experienced culture from other places, in the home, the culture was African from Rwanda. And in the culture of uh, Rwanda, we don't concert uh, people who, you know, therapists or things like that. So when we arrived in Belgium, um, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go to a therapist. Uh, my family, my mom, uh, she's a brave woman. She had to flee with all of us. At that time, we were, uh, I was with my four siblings, and so she got there. She lost her husband, started over her life. So she was also juggling with a lot of things. And so for me, the outlet was art. Um, and so Rwandese people, when they arrived in Belgium, they started this group for uh, dancing and uh, teaching people in the community about their uh, culture. And so that's ever since that I understood that I could use arts as medicine. So I became a dancer. Um, and uh, to the right here, this picture though, was taken a couple years later as I was volunteering with UVU uh, Mockingbird Fly Play. Um, with their dance department. They were teaching the community du during Black History Month. But this is really a picture that portrays how I feel when I'm doing dance and I'm learning, um, you know, new things with dance. Uh, but that time of my life as a teenager was really pivotal in my life um, in um, trying to understand how to cope with emotions. I also went through um, bulimia. One thing I actually never told my daughter, I'm glad she's here so she can learn. Self-image, you know, all the different things women, young women go through, and I'm so glad she presented before me because, you know, that really reminds me of all the different challenges we can go through as a young girl. Um, fast forward, so later I met my husband and then we uh, decided to come to the US and to pursue the American dream. So after getting up of our educations, um, we decide to go to hurricane, uh, to sorry, to Louisiana, and then we have the Hurricane Katrina find us there. Um, my husband, who's also been a refugee in Rwanda, he was one of the survivors in the Hotel Rwanda, as portrayed in a movie. So we both kind of help each other in that, you know, uh, therapy of <laughs> trying to find sense of life, and then we also, you know, got married. And so when we arrived in uh, Louisiana, um, it was interesting. For me, it was the first culture shock. But the real reason we moved there, it was after um, joining the LDS Church and also learning what President Gordon B. Hinckley believed about education. So I'm not gonna read all of that, but basically the calling was to be self-reliant through education and the stress about getting an education, even if you are a woman. Because I, you know, I like how she also, um, Remind me your name, sorry, t t yeah, so like how she is explained the stigma in our society here in Utah of, you know, women uh, to be home, etc. And then for me, when I heard President Binkley uh, talking uh, about education, I was like, I'm a woman, I can do more than this. 
I just joined, you know, I just became uh, married at that time. I just got my education. But the only thing in my head as a Mormon woman now was to go and have kids and be home. And in fact, I told my husband after uh, we got married, which I had two years to go for college, okay, let's have a baby now. And he looked at me and said, no. Finish your education. And so, anyway, I'm glad I found a person who also believed in that. <laughs> but um, really, he was the uh, catalyzer. You know, he was, President Hinckley really helped us, both of us, to even seek higher uh, opportunities for us. So, um, okay, let me move forward. If it's moving, I don't know. It's not moving. Oh, it's frozen. So, Okay, so anyway, after Hurricane Katrina, we went to uh, Utah. And uh, this is just a quote I chose to explain also about the shock I got when I arrived in Louisiana. And after I saw all those people waving on TV, so luckily my husband and I had left when the flood arrived, but many people got trapped because of the life circumstances they had at that time. And for me, it was really shocking. There were some places I went to live in New Orleans and visit when I used to go, um, you know, like consultation for my baby I was carrying at that time. There were some places I couldn't understand how can it be in a country like America to have such poverty, to have places where you could see projects without roofs, etc. And that's later that I understood the dis disparities and the different things that happened in this country that created that, um, that you know, the, the people in America can be as poor as they were at that time. Um, so, next slide. Thank you. Yeah, just before, quickly. I think there was another one before, right? Go back. Yes, go back. Yeah, thank you so much. And so, um, Really fast forward, um, after we arrived in Utah, I at that time couldn't do any professional, I couldn't, do, I couldn't work, okay? My husband was a, a student and at that time I was on a visa called F2, which is the worst visa you can have. Um, I couldn't do anything with that visa besides being the cute woman at home and do the work and that's it, do the work in the house, take care of my kids. But I had so many dreams, okay? And I was suffocating inside of me, as I told you, Arts was my medicine, right? So I even put that on the side, I put everything on the side, and then depression hit me. When I just had her a year after, I realized, okay, I'm not able to get any professional life because of my visa, but there are things I can do. There are things I can do to help the community. So I started volunteering in the community. And um, the reason I showed this slide, it's because at that time I couldn't work because of that. But later, when I went back to Europe, or before we, when I was trying to get a professional career, I had a lot of segregation going on. As a woman, as a black, as an immigrant, and that was mostly in Europe. I, I had that because at that time when I was seeking opportunities, um, I had my European citizenship. I had everything that you have been required to have. I had that higher education that I was required to have. I had the languages. I spoke Dutch that I had to learn. And so it was really interesting to me to be segregate, segregated um, about jobs. But really the lesson from it is uh, never give up. I mean, if there's something you feel like you want to contribute to the society, uh, either through your employment or you trying to get the, that job you've already dreamed, always dreamed of. Don't worry, that means there's something better out for you. And so I chose this quote from uh, Oprah. She says, luck is preparation, meeting the moment of opportunity. And yes, we have to be prepared um, to meet those opportunities. Um, but as I said, you, are, you have to also do your part to believe in it. And so, yeah, let's move on to the next one. I'm trying to really jump everything in a few minutes. Um, and so um, after we um, got to Utah and got to go back to school, by the way, humbled by the fact that our degrees couldn't be accepted from Belgium, we went back to Europe. And then from Europe, I got that professional life I had always dreamed of, but it wasn't an easy journey, as I said. But then later, five years later in 2014, um, I had again this desire to be a better person and uh, I thought about going to back to school and get my master's. 
And so my mom on the left, she was my greatest inspiration and my greatest strength at that time. She put all her little economies on the side to really push me and my family to come back because it wasn't easy. We had our three kids at that time. And luckily, I was able to uh, get my master's at BYU. Um, in Africa, at least in Rwanda, there's this saying that says, umugore ni hindi yurugo. That means really women, and all of us here are women. We are powerful, and sometimes we don't realize. In our society, I grew up knowing that a woman, she's the pillar. So what I just explained, she's the pillar of the home. So if that pillar is not there, the home is gonna collapse. So just keep that imagery as you leave this room. This is something that has stuck in my head all those years up to this day. And my mom has been that pillar for us. She was able to start over her life after uh, becoming a refugee. She was 41 when it happened, when my dad passed away. And she was able to support all of my siblings. I have six siblings to go to school. And we all have at least master's degree and a sister who's in Washington DC doing her, who just finished her PhD in peace and reconciliation. My mom, she used to go in the subways in Brussels. My husband, he's the one who told me that because he's known my mom before he known me. He's like, I used to cross your mom with her clothes backwards in the metro. And she was like every day racing and working hard. She helped the elderly. She, she would like work so hard. And she's just really my greatest inspiration. And I'm sure all of you, you have your inspiration. And I hope you do if you don't start today, OK? And most of the time, women empower other women. That's just how it is. In our society in Africa, that's what we believe as well. Sorry, next one. Thank you. And so here are some takeaways of what I've learned as an educator, because later, um, after getting my MPA degree, this is a funny story I have to tell you, though. When I was doing my internship at the uh, church office building, the RDS church office building in 2015, I was called to help them to identify ways to help, ref to help refugees, so that refugee response that the RDS church was trying to push everybody in the community to love your neighbors and do things like that. So I was sitting on the board of those, like the very first team that started it. So you understand as a refugee myself, my belief was that when I finished the MPA degree, I'll go to the UN and be one of those, you know, big key people and do these big jobs and, uh, or I will be on that job that I just, interned on with the church that I will be starting that big, you know, that big department to help refugees. So I had all these visions in my head, and then I got to be humbled. <laughs> and so I learned that you can serve no matter, don't think that what you think in your head, the way you want to serve, this is where you always serve, but humble yourself and be open enough to the spirit. I'm sorry, I'm gonna use that word. If there are people who are not believers in this uh, room, Please forgive me, but what I want to say is that we women, with the power of creation we have, we have that power to connect. Very, very strong power. So if you in tune, you're going to get so many revelations in your life to make a difference. And so for me, after being disappointed that I wasn't going to do that job, I was like, you know what? But in the meantime, I didn't give up. I was shooting for many jobs at that time, applications, right? My daughter, she comes to me. So my daughter, actually, she's very <laughs> inspiration to me as well, because she's always been also there at the moment. I'm questioning so much. And she's like, mom, did you know they're looking for a French teacher at school? Because they were in the French immersion program. And I was like, yeah, OK, I'm going to apply to it. You know, I went there, I gave my best, I shared the learning I've got from Europe, from my kids to be in elementary school, and to, you know, from my cultural background, and I said all of these things in the interview, and eventually they called me the day of graduation, and the other job also I was actually going to take with the International Rescue Committee, which was more, you know, as I said, you know, big pay, but I would be home at nine every day because it was in Salt Lake. Anyway, so I had to really pray and decide to become a teacher. But 
that was what I needed at that time. So sometimes when things don't turn the way we want, it's because we have a learning to do. We have a purpose, and that purpose, we're not always gonna find it out ourselves. We have to be able to connect to the higher being. And so those are the different things I've learned. Simplify, simplify, simplify. My goodness, Lori Hale, she is amazing. She was my mentor when I started becoming a teacher, among others, Nuri Jimenez, uh, um, and I have also Lisa Gardner, who is here. Where is she? Raise your hands, Lisa. Oh, there you are. I didn't even know where you are. So Lisa is on my team in first grade, and she has been also an inspiration, and Lori, and all of them, they always told me, like, simplify, simplify, simplify. This is something I've learned that I used not to do. And uh, also another thing, um, I don't know if you had a chance to go watch Rita Pearson talk on education. If you haven't, it's a TEDx talk. It's pretty short, seven minutes, and she is amazing. She was saying how human connection is key to be a successful teacher. All of you know that, right? How are you going to impact your children or people around you if you're not connected to them, if you don't show them love, and if you don't show them that you care? So me as an educator, I understood that kids don't learn from the people they don't like. So I had to learn to, the first thing is I have to, to please them, to, to be nice to them. To, sometimes there are days you're like, I'm gonna kill everybody here, but that's okay, including myself, but that's okay. You know, this is part of the journey. Uh, but I had to learn to be loving those around me. It's, it can be even just a thought, a, a very positive thought to those people. Anyway, so seek first to understand as opposed to be understood. That's one thing that is important, to avoid racism, to avoid prejudices, to avoid biases. And take care of yourself, something I always forget. And I find myself to the lowest of the lowest, mentally and physically drowned, and I'm like, oh, yeah, when did I take care of myself? And then I realize I have to just you know, regroup and take care of me. Sorry, the next one, thank you. So just a quick uh, snapshot of some of the crazy things I do that you also can do, okay? So I'm this kind of person when I see a need, and I want you, when I say I, you put your you. you, you think about yourself. When I see a need in the community especially, I jump on it. In April 2018, busy time of our lives as teachers, okay? and I was doing my second master's degree, 20 credits. I read an article in the morning. Um, the RDS church is actually, um, the RDS church is going to celebrate B1, which is a celebration for 40 years after the black people got the priesthood in the church. So me as a black person who've been through racism everywhere I've been in my life, starting in my own country, where the Tutsis and Hutu had to kill each other, going to Europe, having experienced racism as an immigrant who was black from Africa, coming to the Americas, I go to Louisiana, black people look at me like, what you talking like a white person, you know? Those kind of things. And I arrived in Utah and I see people who are like, oh, so Africans live in trees, right? So I was like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to go and share my voice. I called the church head headquarters and I'm, I'm like, okay, um, I think you guys are celebrating, I, I'm here, I can help you, I have talents, I can dance, I know Africa, I know Europe, I know America, I know the community because I've been serving the refugees community here, I've been serving in the, you know, in the school district, actually right now I'm, I'm the chair to the black students, parents committee. Um, so I called them and I'm like, we are here. In one month, we had to be ready for this show. It was the most way, the most powerful way for me to impact a greater communi community here. So I'm not saying this to brag myself, but what I'm trying to say here, let me go back to it again. As women, we are powerful. With that power of creation, we have the possibility to connect with our higher being, our heavenly father, to inspire us every day how we can help others. And for me, this was something that was so important because guess what? Among the 60 people who were on the team, dancing, praising God, uh, you know, after I choreographed the dances, and they, they came to me and they're like, did you know I was 
going through depression at that time? Did you know I was feeling like I don't fit in this community? Did you know that because I experienced racism? Yes, racism exists every day, okay? So be aware, even in this community. So be the power for change for those things because you know better. You know that it's only through understanding that you are capable of changing things around you and understanding not only the people who are different from your color skin, but people who are just different from you, right? Color skin, yes, but it could be somebody who's, don't judge, don't judge those around you, okay? And I'm pretty sure Mayor Kafusi, you understand this better. You're the first woman to be a mayor in this um, city of Provo. So don't put barriers around you. There's so many things you can do. And at that time, I was able to be heard because I had that prompting to follow through something I felt like that was important. And did you notice also when you do something grand and important, how for feared and how actually you get increased in energy and, and, and strength. So don't, don't let yourself, you know, settle for the, um, comment dit ça, quiproquo, c'est ça? Uh, no, le, comment? Oui, voilà. So, anyway, <laughs> sorry. So, um, can somebody read to me what President Russell Nelson said? Who has a big voice, if you want? Yes. Thank you so much. You can move on to the next uh, slide, and I will promise this is the last one. So somebody else can read this quote for me. Lisa, yes. Okay. Yes, and that's really my last words to you. As you leave this room, Try to ponder why African chose this proverb, because most mosquitoes fear are insignificant, and they, but yet they have, they have a role to play in this society, okay? I mean, in the, in the environment, okay? So don't feel like you're insignificant. You can do more than you think. And I am so sorry I, I had to fast forward my presentation. It's really hard to ex share your life experience in such a short time, especially when you feel like you've lived through so many lives, to be honest. Um, but I would just end saying that thank you. Thank you for being here and to be part of this womanhood, the beautiful journey, the most beautiful journey for me. I had to accept it, just saying between you and I. Um, but it's really, really powerful to be a woman, and I hope you don't forget all those things we shared today. Thank you. What a powerful ending statement that you just made for me, that we learn to accept the journey that we're given and make the most of it. Uh, let's give another round of applause for four wonderful speakers. All right, ladies and a, a few gentlemen, who's hungry? We get, all right, so we will talk more about this, but the suffragette movement started with a tea party, and we'll learn more about that, but how appropriate that we gather together for a tea party. So in the back, we have marvelous catering that is ready to feed more than 200 hungry women. So I invite you, we're gonna have a, a quite a brief intermission, about 10 minutes. So if you need to use the restroom right across the hall, those of you that would like to start lining up, please get your food. And then we will be pleased to start our tea party program after that. Thank you. Oh yes, thank you very much. I did have that as a, please take your plates with you. All right, ladies, it looks like most of you are sitting down. We'd like to get started in just a couple of minutes. So if you could take your seats, we'll get started.
It has not been quite a year since I had the distinct opportunity to join Mayor Michelle Kafusi's staff, and I count myself lucky every single day. When you talk about uh, women who empower other women, uh, she is the epitome of that. She is a champion for her staff, both female and male. Every day is fun working with Michelle. Um, I've learned a lot from her. We have a fun team. Uh, and I just feel honored to be able to work with her on a day-to-day -day basis and, frankly, to have the distinct pleasure of introducing her. She is a go-getter. I have never met anybody who has so much energy as she has, and it's contagious. And I love that that's what women can do for women. I am a better employee. I am a better friend. Uh, I'm a better woman for having been able to be in her office. So. With that, it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about my boss and my friend, uh, Mayor Michelle Kafusi. Born and raised in Provo, Utah, Michelle Kafusi grew up following her mother's example by working hard, listening to and championing others, and getting things done. The sixth of seven children, Kafusi was raised not only by her single mother, who worked graveyard, graveyard shifts as a nurse, but also by a village of Provo neighbors, family, and friends. Kafusi attended Wasatch Elementary, Dixon Middle School, and Provo High School before entering Brigham Young University on an academic scholarship. Her degree from BYU is in Global Studies and included work, uh, coursework on local government, so she landed right where she was prepared to land. After meeting her husband in college, and we are pleased to have Steve Kafusi here, a wonderful support for his wife. Absolutely. Michelle was a cougarette, and he was a football player who want, went on to coach at BYU. She married and moved to Philadelphia and New Jersey. She is the mother of five children, two girls, and three boys. And the Kafusis are a fun gang. I hope you have the opportunity to meet them at some point. Kafusi has been actively involved in community service since her children were small, serving on the PTSA boards in her children's elementary and high schools. In 2011, she took her first, ele she took her first elected office as a member of Provo's school board. In time, she served as the board's president. Kafusi has also served on the Provo City Citizens Advisory Board, the Utah High School Athletic Association, and the steering committee for Utah Valley Regional Medical Center's hospital, hospital replacement project. In November of 2017, Kafusi made history when she was elected the first female mayor in Provo City's history. I think we clap for that. Kafusi has been praised for her leadership in securing funding for a Provo Airport expansion as well as for addressing critical infrastructure needs such as Provo's need for a new wastewater treatment plant. In 2019, Mayor Kafusi was awarded the Informed Decision Maker of the Year by the Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute, and it is a pleasure. You're going to enjoy your time with Michelle today. Come on up. Thank you so much, and here I am again. <laughs> but the beauty of it is this time you have food in front of you, so hopefully it'll be pleasant and enjoyable and you'll get your energy up and ready for this next little piece of our program because it is such a significant part. Um, today we celebrate women trailblazers of the past, the present, and the future. And when I say the future, I'm looking into all of your eyes. I need friends in politics with me. <laughs> the, real, the reality is that each of us has a trail trailblazer within us. Each of us can and should support the trailblazer in ourselves and in the women around us. One truth I have found is that empowered women empower women. And that has been stated multiple times today by all my dear friends that have spoke. I'm grateful for this chance together today to celebrate trailblazing women and to gain inspiration to do whatever trailblazing we may be called on to do in our individual lives. So let me start. What a great year to be celebrating International Women's Day. This is the year we are celebrating the first women in the United States to cast a vote. And as you know, it was done right here in Utah. I know that deserves. 
We are also celebrating nationwide suffrage, the right of women throughout the country to vote. And I love that this was a week of voting. I hope you all participated in the presidential primary election. Even when I have to write notes on my whiteboard and follow my adult children around with their ballots, I just will keep doing it. And from the time they were little, I've emphasized voting. But again, last week I had those ballots and I was in their faces saying, this is significant, you've got to vote and forcing them to open it themselves, and a couple of them, and they're all adult children, remember. Mom, just do it for me. No, 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 no. You open it up, you read it, you decide what your vote is going to be, you seal it, sign it, and I'll do the hard labor of dropping it off. <laughs> but I do hope you all participated in our freedoms that we have. Um, whether you sit at your kitchen table and vote by mail, or whether you haul your kids to stand with you at a ballot station, the way I used to do with my kids, the moment when you cast your vote is almost sacred. I'm so grateful for the right to vote and for all those who made it possible here in Utah and around the country. Like I said, I don't take voting lightly. Today is truly a day to remember and celebrate trailblazing women. I'd now like to tell you about one of them. Like me, Esther Eggertson Peterson was a Provo native. She lived here through her graduation from college at BYU. Let me first show you this cute picture of her and her husband later in life. Isn't that darling? She looks like someone we might run into around here right now. Well, Looking at this picture, you might not guess the story she could tell and the trails she has blazed. But here's another photo that gives you a little peek into the circles she ran in during her lifetime. Again, just a Provo gal, born and raised in Provo. From an early age, Esther was passionate about the involvement of women, and she was not afraid to get involved herself. She started as a teacher and from there got involved in the American Federation of Teachers. That experience led to her becoming the first lobbyist for the National Labor Relations Board. Not the first female lobbyist, mind you, but the first lobbyist period. As she got to know the halls of our nation's capital, doing her lobbying work, she caught the attention of President Kennedy who ultimately, ultimately appointed her Assistant Secretary of Labor and Director of the United States Women's Bureau. And her service for presidents did not end there. President Lyndon Johnson named her his Special Assistant for Consumer Affairs. And later, President Jimmy Carter named her, named her his Director of Consumer Affairs. Pretty incredible for a simple gal from Provo with a farmer husband. But actually, he wasn't just a farmer, but he looked really cute in those overalls in that previous picture. Now, I want to be clear about something. You don't need to mingle with presidents to make a difference. Not at all. Until my kids were raised, they were my focus. I got involved where I could, like helping at their schools and serving on committees. But my heart was in my home with my children. And by the way, shout out to all of the amazing friends I got to know through those years. Some of them are here, and Provo is full of amazing women. When you get involved, you'll find you're rubbing shoulders with great folks all around you. I recall the last, well, actually, it was the graduation day of my twins. And I was on the Board of Education. So I had the privilege of speaking at Tim View's graduation and handing them their diploma. I had so many mixed feelings because, number one, I wasn't going to have to nag them anymore. But number two, it was for selfish reasons. I was going to miss being with all their friends' parents almost every night at some sporting event or play or something, fundraiser. And those were my group of friends at the time, and I was going to miss that. I remember the twins. It's, it's a boy and a girl, Devin and Daryl. They're our number four and five 
saying, Mom, you're just crying so much, and I didn't dare tell him, it's not just because you're graduating, <laughs> but it's because I know I'm probably not going to see a lot of my mom friends as much as I would love to. Everyone gets busy. Each woman has to decide for herself where to strike her own balance in life. But I celebrate whatever choice you make, so long as you are living true to what you think you need to do. I believe what Barbara Bush said about how our nation is influenced more by what happens in our houses than by what happens in the White House. At the same time, I believe in serving outside the home. And I really do. I believe we can do that because guess what? Kids are mobile. They'll go where their mom goes. <laughs> Public service is not always easy or comfortable, but I have found that heeding the call to serve is well worth the sacrifice. I hope that you never hesitate to put yourself out there when you feel you're in a position to serve. May I offer one piece of perspective related to that issue of women empowerment. I am 100% supportive of women getting involved in their communities, in good causes, in politics, or in anything else they want to be engaged in. Women should never see themselves as second-class citizens or as unworthy to engage. I see us as equal in every meaning meaningful way to men. We can have a seat at the table and should never feel ashamed of our gender. But I also want to be very clear that I do not see men as the enemy, in any way, actually. And I cringe a bit when I sense a woman who has a chip on her shoulder about gender issues or who sometimes treats men as though we are engaged in a war with them. In my opinion, that approach is unnecessary and counterproductive. It's interesting, I spoke up at the University of Utah at a huge conference of uh, Real Women Run, and maybe some of you have attended that. It's, it's for a lot of women who are kind of thinking and toying with the idea of maybe getting into politics. And I was on a panel with three other mayors, well, two other mayors and a council member. And it started off really okay, but it went downhill really fast, and I was really bothered because they started saying things like, when you walk into that council meeting, you let them know who you are and what you stand for. And, and when you work with those men, you make sure you don't cower. And I just sat there and looked at them all and thought, are you kidding me? That's the worst advice you could give these 200 women. <laughs> because men are not the enemy. Men are wonderful people to work with. Men are fabulous to fight with behind closed doors. You can hit the table with your fist, like I've done, and disagree. And they will hit the table back and disagree. And I try really hard not to jump or act startled. Like, oh, I get to you, okay. But at the same time, the minute the argument is over, it's over with them. They are good soldiers. They agree to walk out of the room all on the same page. And it's valuable, and it's important, and it helps me as a woman, as a leader. They also are very loyal. You win those men over, you never have to fight a battle again. They stand up for you, they speak out for you. So, like I'm stating, men are a crucial part of our success, and they're our partners, not our enemies. It will take all of us working together with mutual respect that will bring about the change we need. In decades of public service and in other settings, I have found myself to be the only woman at the table. And it still happens quite a bit. In fact, preparing for this talk, I started kind of taking note, because I've, I've been working with men so often, I kind of have gotten so used to it, I forgot. But this past 10 days, I've been paying attention. It's unbelievable, really. And then I think, should I feel uncomfortable? Because I look around our big conference table, and it's all men. And they're wonderful, and they're talented, and they're smart. And, and I'm sitting there and I think, I wonder if I should feel intimidated. And then I think, no, I'm not intimidated. This is great. It really is true, though, every day. I have some wonderful women in my office that I've been able to hire, and I'm so glad to have them. In fact, just a quick story, my first couple weeks being mayor, being the first woman mayor in that office, um, 
they didn't know what to do with me, right? I mean, they're just like, what, a woman? And I had one of the gentlemen that's been there for quite a long time come out of his office and say, Mayor, what is all that racket? And I said to him, that is called women. And that is what we do. We talk and we're loud and we laugh, but we get stuff done. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of growing has been going on down in the city offices of Provo in the past three years. Um, overall, I would say my experience in these settings has been wonderful. In my long experience, we are far more productive being comfortable with ourselves, feeling empowered about our own abilities and place, and treating men and women as equals, fully worthy of our respect. God willing, each of us will someday be the age of Esther in this photograph. Whatever your path, I wish you a measure of the contentment I see in this image. Let's go back, Marco, to the other. There we go. I just love her face. She's content, right? She's happy. I mean, the sun's on her face. She's probably like, maybe might be walking barefoot in the dirt. I don't know, but she just looks content. As doors open to us in our lives, let's all pause to, to consider whether we are being nudged to step into broader service than we had planned. When you feel bright about an opportunity, I encourage you to step forward and engage, no matter how scary it is no matter how horrible it's gonna be on Facebook. <laughs> Step out and engage. There's a great story about people and it, it talks about there's those that are on the sidelines that are throwing the arrows and saying things that aren't true about you on social media that are literally lies. Literally throwing the arrows and darts at you. But guess what, you're the one in the arena. So you stand in that arena, you stand tall, and you take those arrows, and you take those bullets, because in reality, they aren't in the arena, you are, and you're there to represent. So just remember, whatever your choice is and whatever your path, I hope you can always rest content that you are just as empowered, just as capable, and just as valued for your contributions as anyone else on this planet. Thank you. I am uh, going to introduce my dear friend Aaron Preston, uh, and then, but first I'm going to talk you through the program. So we'll have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Erin Preston, and she is going to tell us a wonderful discovery story about her great-great-grandma. Uh, and then we will go directly into a video, Well-Behaved Women Rarely Make History, and then we will round out with what I'm sure will be the highlight, and we will be able to honor Miss Lillian. Happy to have you here today uh, with the 2020 Trailblazer Award, and the mayor will be doing that. And then we will end with what I hope is kind of a moment of unity as we all sing together. So with that, I want to talk about Erin for just a minute. I had been looking uh, over on Facebook and had noted a lot of the activities that had taken place at the Capitol uh, in celebration of women. And came across Erin's photo, and you cannot miss Erin. And as she comes up to the stage, you will see why. I immediately noticed her wonderful getup, so to speak. And when I was putting this program together, she flashed in my mind. Uh, just, I, I mean, for no reason other than, I, I have no idea. I just seen it, she flashed in my mind. I reached out to her, and as she was sharing her story, I got a little bit of goosebumps, and I thought this is a story that the rest of you ought to hear, particularly as we celebrate our sister suffragettes today. So with that, I am going to let you enjoy the very, <laughs> the wonderful costume that Erin is coming up, and looking forward to hearing her story. pleasure getting to be with you and speak with you today. I'm going to introduce you to what? Oh. Hello. Can you hear me now? Such a pleasure being with you today and getting to speak with you today. I'm going to introduce you to my great great grandma, Lucy Augusta Rice Clark. I'm going to do that in a minute though because I have to give you the backstory on on this. 
First of all, um, gr I grew up on a farm in Idaho, uh, traditional Mormon family, very 1950s-ish, uh, with the expectation that I should be sweet and obedient and um, not be what I was, which was very intense and outspoken. Uh, I remember starting fights about political discussions when I went to war with my dad over the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, when I was six. It didn't really stop at any point in time. The rest of the family just kind of looked at me with amusement, and I thought, surely I'm adopted. <laughs> um, I went on to BYU, down the street, got two degrees, an undergrad degree and a law degree, and I thought I was the first woman in my family to have graduated from college. Um, happily went on with a career in business, law, politics, uh, and I thought I was an anomaly. Again, adopted. Um, went through some hard times over the last eight, nine years. Um, I won't go into all of them, but I ran for political office and lost in a very narrow uh, vote on a very, very difficult election where uh, I was attacked as a woman for doing things. Uh, my kids were attacked. Um, and I suffered a little bit of a bitter defeat where I, you know, felt bad. Um, a couple years later, my husband died unexpectedly, and then I learned what real grief is. Um, at that point, I could either descend into feeling sorry for myself or do something with that. And what I did with that is I started digging into my background, into my ancestry, which I thought I knew, to try and find tough women's stories of tough women who came before me and who had made it through worse. And I found plenty. But the one that was such a surprise to me, I thought I knew the history of my mother's side of the family. I knew nothing. Um, it had all been erased, forgotten. Um, but digging through some hard research, I started coming across newspaper articles. And then I found other information, and what I found was this amazing woman named Lucy Augusta Rice Clark. So the Saints first came into Utah in 1847. She was born in 1850, so right there. On census records, birth certificates, everything, she always listed as her place of birth, Zion, because that's where she was from. Her mother uh, started, immediately started a private school up in uh, uh, Kaysville, Farmington area. Her mother, in addition to raising 12 children and two Indian children that were brought to her home, she taught at the school and uh, taught most of the kids of Farmington in that time. Uh, my great-great-grandma began teaching at that school at the age of eight. She was an associate teacher and she taught until uh, she was in her 20s. She had 11 children. The first three died in infancy. infancy. Um, from there, the children did better and she pushed education on them very, very hard. Uh, eventually, all of the children went to college. She got all of her children to college as the sole breadwinner in her family starting multiple businesses, including uh, financing other women's startup businesses. This is at a time when women couldn't own property, women couldn't get loans, and so being able to have a woman you could rely on was really important. She did that. She also started the Young Women's uh, in Farmington, which was intended to be a training ground for women to be more outspoken, strong, and independent. Uh, I don't know how much we continue to follow that. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Anyway, a little bit about her history. So, of course, women first became able to vote in 1870 here. I hate to say that we were given the right to vote because I really think we earned it. I think that the early saints had really worked hard. The women were strong. They were running households. They were raising kids. They were doing things that were incredibly strong. I think the men recognized that and recognized the advantage that they would bring. 1870, my grandma was uh, 20 years old. In 1887 to 1896, we had that vote taken away. Um, so during that time period, 1887 to 1896, Lucy, like many of the great founding suffragettes, said, oh no, they don't. This is not going to happen. And she started holding various rallies, she started speaking out publicly, and she started speaking out on a national stage of 
we deserve the right to vote. We were better to have the right to vote. We will do good things for this country. Give us the right to vote. She, in 1891, she was the, one of the founding members of the U Utah Women's Press Club. Um, she organized the Utah uh, exhibition at the Chicago World's Fair, which had the very first exhibit of women's, first pavilion of women's work that was designed for women around the world and from the nation to come and exhibit their work, be it art, uh, textiles, whatever. Um, she helped organize that and bring a lot of women back to Chicago where they could speak about their experiences in voting and continue to press the cause for women nationwide. Uh, she held various meetings continuously using the organization that she was using and uh, had taught in uh, the church to um, hold various meetings where she would speak to community congregations and church leadership about why women needed to have the right to vote, why it was better for everyone if women had the right to vote. Uh, in the last one she held, Joseph F. Smith made the comment about her compelling speech that I have no reason left to not see why women should have the right to vote. In 1886, women got the right to vote back um, when Utah gained uh, statehood. Also in 1896, women ran for office for the first time. Um, how many of you know who the first woman senator was in Utah? Oh, shout it out. Come on, ladies. Martha Hughes Cannon, that's right. And her, her statue is going back to the Capitol. There were actually three women in that race, though. Uh, the other one was Emmeline Wells and my grandma. Uh, she was nominated by Davis Rich in Morgan Counties to be their representative. She lost the race uh, to a man who went on to be the Senate president and eventually the governor. She didn't spend too much time worrying about it, though, not from what I've been able to see. She went on to do more. In 1990, four years later, she served as the vice president of the Utah State Council of Women and was a delegate to the National Suffrage Convention in D.C., where she testified in the U.S. Senate um, for women's suffrage nationwide. In 1908, she was named as the Utah delegate for the National Presidential Convention. She was the very first woman in the nation to vote in a presidential convention. She voted for Taft. Um, when she got to the convention, they asked a little bit about her, and she said, I am a mother. And I've thought a little bit about that. Was that her sole identity, or was that her saying, I am the first mother to vote here. Listen to me. Um, in her later years, she didn't slow down. She served on her local town council. She uh, got Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie to give money for them to build a local uh, library. And in 1920, she began voting as part of all of the women in the United States when they regained the right to vote. She died eight years later and is buried here. I have thought a lot since learning about her well, when I found her, 1918, my, or excuse me, 2019, the senility sitting in, sorry. I thought, why did I not know about this woman? I've stood out like the blackest sheep of the family for so long. I knew my grandpa well. He only died four years ago. This was his grandmother. His mother was her first daughter, also named Lucy. By the way, in my family, they used to pass down the names among the women. Anyway. Why did he say nothing? Why couldn't he see that I was the sore thumb and I needed to know that somebody else like this existed? All my grandpa would ever talk about with that family history is that he wouldn't talk about it, although he made a passing comment at one point that he felt dumb with that part of the family. In looking back now and with a little bit of frustration that he didn't ever tell me about her, I'm like, maybe you were the dumb one. Um, <laughs> He was one of the only grandchildren who never went to college. He didn't want to. The other uh, family members all stepped in to offer to pay for it. But that became the point in, in my family where nobody went to college anymore. Um, he intentionally didn't tell me about her. He knew her. There was overlap. My mom knew nothing about her. So when I discovered this woman, it was like, I'm not adopted. I come, I come on the shoulders of strong women. And in researching these other women, I think we've forgotten, pardon me for this, what badasses these women were. <laughs> we stand on such strong shoulders. 
And if you see a little bit of rebuke in her face, like, what have you guys done lately? That's how I feel. So I'm an education attorney. I've raised many kids. I have gone through hard things. I've run for office. I've done stuff. I feel pretty good about it. When I found her, I thought, what in the world have I done? I haven't done nearly enough. At some point, I think she and I are going to be sitting down for whatever version of a tea party exists in heaven. And here's what I think that she's going to be saying to me, or would say to me if she could do that right now. Thank you for getting in the fight. Thank you for at least stepping in. Thank you for trying to make some changes. Thank you for finding me when I got erased. But what else have you got to do? Because you guys are getting lazy. So at a time when we didn't have the right to own property, to take out loans, to vote, I was doing all of these things. And oh yeah, I had eight kids that I was supporting and educating. Your kids aren't even in college yet, or at least not all of them. What are you doing? Why are there not more of you in office? Why do you not even vote? Why do you tell women not even vote? Do you not remember how hard we fought for this, what you've done? Um, you need to fight harder. Why do you continue to be paid the lowest rate of any state in the nation for women, uh, women's earnings? Start your own businesses. I did. I paid for other women to start their businesses. I honestly think that she would give me that exact look of why haven't you done more? And I love the conference, what are you waiting for? We stand on the shoulders of some very strong, amazing women who are wondering what we are going to do to live up to their legacy. I feel very, um, very much like I owe them and I need to do more. I hope, that, I hope that this is a positive message for you. Thank you for listening to my story. This is a food reminder because we have a ton of additional food. So uh, both the mayor and Aaron spoke about the legacy that we're honoring today and particularly at this luncheon. And so we're going to start a video here momentarily. But please feel free to get up. They'll continue to serve the food for another, another five minutes. So this is the countdown for all of the goods that are back. There's plenty of desserts. I can see the chocolate cake calling my name as we speak. So. Please feel free, and then we will just go ahead and start the video. Uh, oh, can we dim the lights? Can we have, where's, do you know where the, I'm going to find a place to dim the lights, just a minute. Like another great moment that ended in a tea party and thus changed this country's history, the women's suffrage movement also started with a tea party. On July 9, 1848, five previously well-behaved women sipped and stewed, lamenting society's injustices to women. As fate would have it, their justified grievances would give birth to the Convention on Women's Rights. These misbehaving women were, in fact, trailblazers. Jane Hunt, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott and her sister Martha Wright, and Marianne McClintock. Five women, surrounded by dainty teacups, chose a seemingly demure social event to change society and women's lives forever. On that day, they resolved to form a society to advocate for the rights of women. On July 19th and 20th, 1848, the first women's rights conventions were held, with more than 300 men and women attending. At its conclusion, 68 women and 32 men had signed the Declaration of Sentiments. They wanted nothing more than equality. They wanted education, the opportunity to vote. They didn't want their livelihood and property belonging to the men in their lives. 
They felt chained by a societal moral code that seemed to guide their every thought and action. In the summer of 1920, more than 70 years after that first convention in Seneca Falls, Congress finally passed a federal women's suffrage amendment to the U.S. Constitution by the narrowest of margins, one vote to be exact. On August 26, now celebrated as Women's Equality Day, the 19th Amendment officially became part of the Constitution. Despite their inexperience and uncertainty as to what they may eventually accomplish, they resolved to smash the sexist norms of their day. And they did it with their pinkies raised. This could have been like any other tea party, filled with the gossip of the day, but they would not, could not wait to have the impact they were born to have. They set an example for every woman who followed. We too are born to have an impact, yet to be decided. Trailblazer, defiant, bold, risk takers, resilient. It's not easy to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, to face ridicule, disdain, and uncertainty, to take that leap in spite of all obstacles because the very possibility of forging change is worth the potential fall. Most importantly, trailblazers are those who don't wait for the right time or for permission. They do what needs to be done when it needs to be done, sometimes loudly, but most times quietly, without a desire for recognition. They do it because it's the right thing to do and someone has to do it. Trailblazers surround us as unsung heroes who change lives without most ever knowing of their contributions. We were tasked with the job to put something, a public work of art into Provo. Um, and we decided to make a mural. We thought, let's put up a statement that's thought-provoking, um, and we came up with, what are you waiting for? La frase del tema de hoy es, ¿qué estás esperando? What are we waiting for to empower women? What are we waiting for to give them the challenges that they're ready for? Well, I'm not waiting anymore. Uh, that's what it means to me. It, I took advantage of my circumstances and instead of looking for the negative and going down that path, I thought, okay, I've got this situation, so I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna make the best of it and I'm gonna work really hard and I'm gonna make a difference and I'm gonna be able to help other people that were in my same situation to make a difference. Um, well, I am an artist and just in the past, you know, 100 years since women have really started to be at the forefront it's been so refreshing to see just how much women support each other. Y no tenemos que esperar para mañana para lograr lo que deseamos hacer hoy. Y eso es lo que esa frase me inspira a sentir y a creer. This thing has been so important for us and I want to make sure everyone has this experience. So I would love for everyone to go check it out. It's 145 North University Avenue. It's behind Ma's restaurant. So you kind of have to go through a little alleyway and you'll stumble upon it, it'll be a little secret, but I take a little bit of time to think about what it means to you and how, what you can do to not wait for anything. Provo motorists driving through the mouth of Provo Canyon may not know that they have a soft-spoken, tenacious woman to thank for saving their spring water supply. Lillian Hayes turned 100 years old on January 21st, 2020 a true suffragette in age and purpose. Her smile and kind eyes hide the environmentalist moxie inside of her. She is a friend of the earth, the water, and the air that residents breathe. She also cares for the wildlife, particularly the birds in the area. What took this stay-at-home mom and PTA president on a journey from caring about school conditions at Mazer Elementary to fighting the government to save the environment was a story she read in a 1969 edition of the Daily Herald about a new road that was planned to go up Provo Canyon. She turned to her neighbor, Clark Newell, who had been Provo's water master for 40 years, for more insight. She told him where the road would be built along the north wall of the canyon. It didn't sit well with him. Lillian's work paid off and forced a change in the road's alignment so it wouldn't go over the springs between the Olmsted Power Plant and Wildwood Housing Area. Lillian's legacy is that of a Utah County woman who was concerned about and fought for the environment before it was on most people's radar. One woman made a difference. Lillian's hope is that every woman and young girl will be a trailblazer 
Make a difference, whether it's for the environment or education, for issues big or small. As women, we stand on the brave shoulders of the trailblazers who came before us and inspire us today. Women like Lillian, Jane, Elizabeth, Lucretia, Martha, and Mary, and so many whose names we don't know. Lillian is living, breathing proof that women trailblazers make a difference. She was born in 1920, the year the cause that motivated five other trailblazers changed women's history forever. She didn't shirk when it was her turn in 1969, and the one thing she and her sisters in spirit would tell all of us today is to find our own trail to blaze. What are you waiting for? So I don't know, I'm such a political geek, but as I was seeing all those women's names and faces, I'm over there bawling, because <laughs> I'm just so proud of them, because I wouldn't be standing here today as your first woman mayor without them. Oh, I've got to get over this. <laughs> so should women be allowed to vote? Yes or no? Yellow rose or red rose? How many of you have seen the yellow rose this year? Yes. These were the questions weighing heavily on the minds of the 96 male legislatures in Nashville, Tennessee in August 1920. Their answers to those burning societal questions would determine the po political fate of women. The 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote, had been passed by Congress the previous year. However, under the Constitution, 36 of the 48 state legislatures had to approve. By the spring of 1920, 35 states had ratified and six had rejected. And Tennessee seemed the most likely to ratify. The last chance, as it were. So, these votes were making history one way or another. Suffrage supporters wore yellow roses. Those opposed wore red. The Tennessee State Senate went yellow, but the House was evenly split. The first vote was a tie. The second vote was a tie. On the third and final vote, one man who had been wearing a red took the advice of his mother that day to be a good boy replacing his red rose with a bright yellow rose and with that trailblazing moment. See, I'm a mess. Combined with so many before it, the 70-year-old battle for women's suffrage was won. Thanks, whoever put this napkin up here. <laughs> It seems only fitting to continue to honor this sim symbol of victory for suffragettes, the yellow rose, not only in this historical year of great significance for women, but every year in recognition of the contribution of my sister trailblazers, past, present, and future. So I am pleased to introduce the 2020 Trailblazer Award and now that you have heard her story of grace and courage, let me grab her. <laughs> her daughter just said, it's your time. <laughs> I saw that.
in recognition of the contributions of my sister trailblazers, past, present, and future, I am pleased to introduce the 2020 Trailblazer Award. And now that you have heard her story of grace and courage, it will come as no surprise that Lillian Hayes, born in that pivotal year of the suffragette history, who woman carried on the trailblazing trait to make her own mark on history, is the ideal honoree. It is my privilege and pleasure to honor Lillian Hayes as our much deserving 2020 Trailblazing Award recipient. So this is the Trailblazer Award that I decided to go with due to the history of the Yellow Rose. Uh, I know you're all thinking Beauty and the Beast, but that's okay because it's significant. <laughs> I had the privilege of going into Lillian's home and spending some time with her. And I'm telling you, she is amazing. And just check out her purple sneakers. She had them on when I was there the other day too. One of my favorite parts about Lillian when I was spending time with her was we were getting ready to take a photo and she was patting her pocket and her daughter said, oh, she wants her lipstick on her lips. She does better if her red lips look red for photos. <laughs> Lillian, thank you for everything you've done for us in Provo. It's the truth. Every time we get a glass of water or turn on our faucet for drinking water, we thank you for all your hard work. It's no surprise why we chose Miss Lillian as our honoree today, and we're so pleased that her family could join. And is it not an ironic coincidence that Amy, unbeknownst to all of us, uh, happened to be here as a speaker? So I feel like some things happen because they're meant to happen. So we are going to have this little sing-along moment that I told you about. I think it's only appropriate that we end with kind of a moment of unity before our closing comments. And so with that, we've got preparations going on backstage. We will be uh, loading up a video. So, all right, I'm going to age myself here just for a minute, but who has seen and loved the original Mary Poppins? Oh, I thank you. I, even if you're just doing that to make me feel better. I loved that movie, and in it you'll recall, or if you, if you haven't recalled until this moment, a Sister Suffragette song that Miss Beautiful Janelle Pugmire reminded me of. And so this is my little ode to Janelle as a, as a nice addition to this program. So... We have us, uh, we're preparing some sister suffragettes in the back. If you'll look on the back of your program, the words are there. No one needs to feel ashamed to, to sing out loudly. So give us just one moment and we will let you know when we're ready to go. All right. We have our concluding remarks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in conclusion, I'm going to let the mayor end, but I wanted to show you one last photo, um, and I need to have a look here. Miss Harley. Ah, come, come up here. I thought this, we've talked so much about empowering women. I wanted to, again, kind of share with, with you something that just happened at the same time was Harley reached out, and uh, one of her hobbies uh, is photography. She reached out wanting to uh, take a picture of the mayor with a theme because the mayor was somebody that she admired. And we worked out a time where we could bring Harley as she visited Miss Lillian. And what I found so amazing was you had a, a young girl who was honoring an older woman, who was honoring an older woman. It was such a circle of empowerment. 
Uh, and the theme that Harley had chosen was to place a Wonder Woman crown on women in their daily lives because all of us are Wonder Women in whatever way we choose to be. And so I wanted to end with this moment that we captured, thanks to Harley and her theme, so. And I hope this is what we take away as well, in addition to all of the wonderful inspiration we have, is that women supporting women is really what we all need to do, and elevating one another, and, and helping us each achieve our, our, the heights that we can achieve. And so Harley kind of brought that. I thought that was a nice closing message for us. And with that, thank you so much for attending. I would like to turn over the time to the mayor to wrap this up. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to spend your Saturday with us. It's meaningful to me, and I'm sure you're leaving a better, stronger, better informed woman. <laughs> I know I am. Uh, with that said, the events are going all day. If you follow us on social media, Mayor Kafusi, you'll know we've done yoga, we've hiked the Y, we've done a bunch of, I did a trail run this morning at eight o'clock, well, 7.30 on Bonneville Shoreline. There's a lot of exciting things going on on behalf of women this morning and for the rest of the day. Let me plug our, what are we calling our party? Our, uh, Roaring our Roaring 2020 party tonight, right here in this room from eight to 10 p.m. We are going to celebrate all these women and all the groundbreaking trailblazing women that have come before us with a celebration, and believe me, has anyone come to this party before? Raise your hands. Yeah, we have fun, right? The music's loud, the food's amazing, we always have crazy things going on that you can participate in, and tonight will not disappoint. So please join me tonight here from eight to 10. And thank you again for spending this morning and afternoon with us, we really appreciate it. And then one more last fun idea for you that Miss Whitney just reminded me about. We have the tiny art show that's happening uh, in the rec center. It's a, has a, it's a pop up on display, and the tiny art show is a community art project based in Provo, obviously. They installed a special mini pop up show uh, that highlights female artists throughout history who are often overlooked, and that is located where? It's really tiny, yes, it is a tiny art show, so don't miss it. The point here is you're not going to want to miss the tiny art show as it, this is the last day for it. And so on your way out, have a look at that. Don't forget we have Dr. Madsen's, it looks like some of you have been up here, thank you. So if you are interested in uh, any of these materials, let us know. Lastly, the mayor has a gift for each one of you. Um, they are t-shirts with our theme. So what... Um, I don't want to create pandemonium, so all of the ladies that are helping, if we could position ourselves, we have small to 2X. If you are encountering the fact that you either didn't get a shirt or it wasn't the size that you wanted, we have a sign-up sheet, uh, and we will be pleased to get the proper size for you. So do not leave without seeing the tiny art show, getting your gift from the mayor, and then join us again next year. Thank you. Thank you.